All right, we'll get started here in just a few moments. All right, welcome everyone to day last. Uh, unusual for April, we don't have any carryover items from a previous day, so we just have our administrative matters for the day. Uh, before we get started, I will see if our executive director, Merrick Burden, has any announcements. Yes, good morning, Mr. Chairman, council members. Um, no announcements for me this morning. All right, and um, the checkout time is noon. Um, if we think we're gonna go much past 10.30, we'll take a break, but if we can wrap up by then, we won't need to do that. Um, so we will get started with the agenda item H2, membership appointments and council operating procedures. And I'll look to our deputy director, Mike Berner. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik. Good morning, council members. Uh, agenda item H2 is where we typically look at membership appointments and COP changes. Uh, I'm not aware of any COP changes before you uh, at this session, but we do have some appointment business to get through here. Um, regarding council officers, members, and designees, there uh, are no changes to that lineup uh, for this session. Regarding council advisory body appointments, there's some business to take care of here for the Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team. We have two nominations to consider. Uh, National Marine Fishery Service Southwest Fishery Science Center has nominated Dr. Brittany Schwartzkopf to the a new position on the Coastal Plastic Species Management Team, formerly held by Dr. Kevin Hill. Uh, additionally, the Northwest uh, National Marine Fishery Service West Coast Region has nominated Ms. Taylor DeBevick to, to the NIMS position currently held by Mr. Josh Lindsay. Uh, the SSC took a look at these and those are discussed in closed session. And if the council wishes to move forward with these, we would need a motion on these. I would like to pause just a second and express my uh, gratitude to both Dr. Hill and uh, Mr. Lindsay, Dr. Hill served on the management team for more than 20 years and was on the SSC for, I believe, eight years. Uh, I had the privilege of working him with closely on both CPS and SSC matters way back when, and uh, oh, I'm a de great debt of gratitude, and I believe the council does too. He's done a lot of great service. Uh, Josh as well, he came on right about the same time I was coming into CPS, and we both kind of learned the ropes together, and uh, I owe a lot to Josh. We did a lot of good work together, in my opinion, so I appreciate both of their efforts. Uh, the Habitat Committee, we have uh, a nomination from the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife has nominated Ms. Laura Brown to replace Ms. Randy Thurston as the WDFW representative on the Habitat Committee. And again, we need a motion there if the council were gonna move forward with that nomination. Um, and finally, for the model evaluation work group in the salmon world, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife has nominated Ms. Emily Shallow uh, to the vacant ODFW position on that group. Uh, and again, we heard from the SSC on that earlier in the week. And if the council wanted to move forward with that, uh, we would need a motion there as well. Uh, lastly, I would just point out that at the March meeting, as the council was discussing some items under ground fish, particularly in regard to stock definitions and, and stocks in the FMP, uh, that the council has a scoping session scheduled for that topic in June, and the council thought it might be wise to uh, consider uh, appointing an ad hoc committee to take on that large task as we endeavor uh, on that uh, work for the next year or two. Um, if you, uh, in your briefing materials for this agenda item under H2A, there's a report from the GMT as well as a report from the GAP on this topic re re uh, recommending some potential representation for such a group if the council wanted to move forward with that. Uh, I don't want to steal any thunder there, but the, the, there are some lists of seats for your consideration. Uh, I guess I would just share a little bit of staff feedback I've had on that since that came out. Um, you'll see when the GMT report, or perhaps you've already read there, that there's some uh, representation that would include the SSC. Uh, I've heard some discussion about whether or not um, it's a good idea to have the, the SSC as largely a review body also in, in, on the body that, that does the work, so to speak. But um, Anyway, that's at the, the purview of the council, but one staff suggestion might be that uh, if the council were to move forward with, with a list, particularly if it included SSC representation, to perhaps hold off on filling those seats until we can get a chance for the SSC to weigh in at the June meeting. This, our staff pointed out that our groundfish staff and many groundfish folks are very busy between now and June with the specs. 
Uh, June is going to come up pretty quickly. Uh, and at the June meeting is where you're planning to scope out that uh, that item and, and kind of talk about the process and the way forward. So uh, I guess in short, there may not be a, a strong need nor enough time to, to really get that group going before June anyhow. So just some some th some comments for thought there, not at all trying to steer your decision, but we'll, we'll get there. Um, I also quickly let uh, close up my sit sum here by reviewing some recent vacancies we've got just as a reminder I'm, this is certainly not a comprehensive list of all the vacancies in our rosters just some that uh, are some are new and some the council's been working on this year uh, there's three three new resignations we got this week uh, Tim Roy uh, the sport industry rep on the habitat committee uh, has resigned that seat uh, Michael Kornman who's the uh, CPSAS Washington commercial representative has resigned that seat and Michael Sawin on the Salmon Advisory Subpanel, the Washington Charter Representative, has resigned that seat. Uh, also, we left March with a vacancy on the gap for the processor seat, and there's a vacancy left from March for the Northwest or Columbia River Tribal Representative on the Habitat Committee. So just summarizing those uh, for your information and happy to move forward with those uh, as you wish. Uh, there's, there's not a ton of time between now and June. If we were to get a nomination up quickly after this meeting, it would have a two or maybe three week period to collect those nominations for your consideration at your June meeting. Um, if we opened those in June, there'd be a longer time to solicit nominations, but then there'd be an obviously a longer time before we had someone in any of those seats. So uh, just a quick summary of, of recent vacancies. Uh, hopefully that helps. I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you, Mike. Are there any questions of Mike on the overview? So um, if there are no questions, we'll go to our reports. We'll first hear from the Groundfish Management Team. Lynn, welcome. Yeah, good morning. This is agenda item H2A, supplemental GMT report um, on the council advisory uh, appointments and operating procedures. As we mentioned back in March, the team believes that the workload and expertise needed to conduct the review of stock complexes and defining stocks are beyond the capacity of the GMT alone. Additional expertise will need to be brought in to conduct the necessary analysis, including experts on biology and life history, habitat associations, geographic ranges, and productivity and susceptibility analysis. To ensure the workload is manageable and conducted in a timely manner, the necessary expertise is, uh, and that the necessary expertise is included and the various interested groups such as the GMT, GAP, NIMFS, Science Centers and Region are all part of the process, the team believes that forming an ad hoc work group may be the best path forward. We don't currently have recommendations on the full membership of the work group as that is up to the council to determine, but suggest membership include at least one GMT representative from each state, and of those three representative, ensuring there's at least one commercial and at least one recreational person. In other words, not having all three of them be the commercial people or all three being the recreational people. One commercial and one recreational GAP member, a representative of the SSC, NIMS West Coast Region Policy Regulatory Staff, NIMS Science Center staff with a variety of expertise, one tribal representative and likely state agency staff with needed expertise as needed. We think that based on our experience over the last couple of years, some of this work in the associated meetings should be able to be accomplished virtually um, to save on travel time and costs. However, one in person may be necessary to accomplish the task and finalize any reports. Um, I'll field any questions. Thank you, Lynn. Are there any questions on the GMT report? Corey Ridings. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Lynn. Um, given that you're recommending adding some members of the public to this group, I'm wondering if you discussed adding a member from the conservation community. Thank you. Chair Grilnick, Ms. Ridings. Uh, we did not have that discussion, but as soon as um, you were acknowledged, I realized we, we should have included that. It, wa it was not delivery. We just hadn't thought that far ahead yet. Any other questions of the team? Thank you very much, Lynn. We'll now uh, have the uh, a report from the GAP. Susan Chambers, welcome. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Chair Gorelnik. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Gorelnik, Mr. Pettinger, and council members. My name is Susan Chambers, 
and I will be reading from agenda item H2A, Supplemental Gap Report 1. The Groundfish Advisory Panel reviewed the Supplemental GMT Report 1 under this agenda item and agrees that an ad hoc work group with the expertise needed to conduct a review of stock complexes in defining stocks is necessary. The GAP also supports the GMT's proposal for the core composition of the group. The GAP considers this an important issue and believes GAP representatives, one recreational, one commercial, could help inform the discussion related to stock complexes and defining stocks. And that concludes our statement. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Susan. Are there any questions of Susan? Thank you, Susan. Um, I don't believe we have any public comment. So that will take us to our council uh, discussion and action here. We've got a number uh, of things. We, we have some appointments. We have to discuss the ad hoc uh, proposal for an ad hoc committee and uh, what we want to do with the current vacancies on advisory bodies. So um, before we move to any motions, let's just see if there's any discussion. Uh, maybe we can take up the ad hoc issue first and see what the pleasure of the council is there. <laughs> Maggie. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think from my perspective, an ad hoc committee does make sense. Um, I think we all recognize that there, there will need to be representatives from each state. We will need to be hearing uh, input from our scientific advisors, um, whether that's through the SSC, the, the science centers, or both. Um, we will need uh, uh, some advisor, uh, some of the GAP members, I, I think. Um, recognizing that discussions and progress on this issue could be made regardless of whether a committee is formed. It does seem to me that having the, the structure of a committee and the potential for facilitation and, and support just of, of the committee and its logistics and operations seems like it could be um, helpful to the process. Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I think I concur with the remarks uh, made by Mr. Berner earlier um, that not sure a whole lot of progress can be made on this topic between now and June. And we are lacking input from at least the SSC on this topic. Um, I also feel like maybe a, a NIMS report of sorts might be useful, um, both from the region and the science centers. So um, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm not completely confident that establishing a work group or a committee um, is going to be necessary. It may be. Um, it, it's not a bad idea, but there may be other approaches. I know I had heard discussion in the hallway about um, possibly holding a workshop first uh, as kind of a kickoff event. I don't know where that discussion went, but it it uh, didn't sound like a bad idea. So um, I, I think maybe it's it's just timing isn't quite right ripe yet to uh, make any firm decisions uh, at this stage. Thanks. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Chair Chair Grelnick, um, and I appreciate the comments from both uh, Maggie and Marcy. I. Um, I think I think an ad hoc work group will be really helpful. I I think there's a, a broad range of expertise that will be needed to um, work through this issue and and don't want to see it just on the backs of the GMT. Uh, so really want to make sure that's there, but also agree with Marcy that we um, in terms of setting one up at this meeting, um, I think without especially the SSC weighing in. Um, I'm, 
I don't think we're ready for that, but I appreciate having the conversation now about it, um, flagging the idea that that we could talk more about this ad hoc group in June under the scoping of this. And um, this morning in our morning meeting, we talked about uh, what a potentially big issue this is and, and um, so how we handle that and how we break it down into smaller pieces and prioritize our work through this process, I think uh, will be part of that discussion in June too. So thank you. Thank you, Heather. So um, I, I think what I'm hearing is people think it might be a good idea, but maybe we need to have further discussion in June about this. Uh, also, I would note that if we were going to appoint a committee that requires consultation with council members and obviously there's not time to do that now. So can we, is there general agreement to think about this and, and maybe have a further discussion in June? Okay, I'm not, Mr. Berner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just for clarity, the formation of the group itself would require a motion of the council, uh, that being the representation and you know, the fact that there is the committee. It's the people that then would be appointed to the seat that can happen uh, at, at your discretion in consultation with the council. Uh, so we'll move forward. I maybe put some summaries of this discussion in the, in the situation summaries for the stock definition item and the COP item for the June meeting, and, and we'll have a further discussion of this topic then. Great. And then maybe a, maybe a motion at that time. Mr. Anderson. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I agree with with your summary. I, um, I think a group will be need needed, uh, and I think we need to formalize it to ensure that we have the appropriate expertise on it. Um, I also don't think we should try to go too far today. Um, and I, you know, thinking about the workshop idea and all of that. Um, so um, I think, and I also think we'll need the help of the council uh, to organize, to help organize the meetings and all that uh, as well would be an added reason to have a committee formed under the council umbrella. So, uh, but I think we need to hold off deciding on the committee until June and have some, give some further thought about what the composition might look like. All right, thank you. So I guess we'll, we'll discuss this again in June and maybe be prepared then or maybe not. Um, Let's take up next the issue. We have some vacancies on advisory bodies, and I guess it's really a question of timing. Um, there's a little bit of time between now and the briefing book deadline to take up these items in June, but if we decide to take up the nominations in September, we would have more time to advertise um, and solicit a nomination. So I guess it's, what, what, what's the sense of the council? Bill Anderson. Well, I guess I'll just I'll speak to the Washington Charter one. Um, I had originally thought that putting out a solicitation now um, with the potential of making an appointment in June made the most sense. But as I think about the compressed timeline that we have here in terms of getting the solicitation out, getting them back, and there's going to need to be some discussion within, I think, the charter industry in Washington to figure out a replacement. I I am more inclined to wait until, oh, well, wait, whatever the right timing is, but wait until September to actually make the appointment, so. All right, is there any disagreement with, with that? Are there any of these uh, vacancies that were mentioned that folks think it's imperative that we get someone appointed sooner? Vice Chair Pettinger. Yeah, thank you, Chair Grolnick. Um, I think dealing with the processor North seat, it's a pretty small community, and you think that the word could get out fairly quickly, and uh, maybe they're probably thinking about somebody already, and uh, I think it might be wise to maybe put that one out um, and get that seat filled. Um, I would expect that there, people have been thinking about that. So it's not like it's a larger universe with the entire West Coast, right? We're talking about so many companies, and so... And they have a processes association, and I think they could probably figure out someone to put on there. So, 
Okay, so that's processor north on the on the gap on the gap. And w was there a tribal vacancy we needed to fill as well, Mr. Oatman? Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I think with the uh, habitat committee, uh, we do have a uh, nominee uh, to potentially take up in June. Uh, same may be the case for the model and evaluation work group. Okay, so um, Mr. Berner, if we were to, in, in terms of advisory bodies here, um, the process, a gap processor north and tribal habitat committee and um, I, I'm not sure if we handle the model evaluation workshop differently than the advisory bodies, but at least in terms of advisory bodies, those two, um, could we get those out um, for the June meeting and leave the, leave the balance for September? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, I believe we could. Uh, we don't typically solicit for like the MU or the salmon technical team or our other technical teams, but we could certainly entertain an, a nomination if one should come forward. Uh, we certainly could open any of these. Again, there's just a compressed time frame, but if it sounds like there's some some um, names out there that people think we could turn that around, I'd be happy to. So what I'm hearing is the, the tribal seat on the habitat committee and the processor seat on the gap, which I'll just note is a, it's just an at-large processor seat. It's not a north-south thing, but um, we, we, we could put a nomination out there pretty quickly after this session and, and, and see what comes. So is that acceptable to the council? Okay, then I think that's, that's what we'll do. And, and in terms of the model evaluation workshop, if that comes forward in June, we can, we can pick that, we can take that up in June. Um, is there any further discussion on the vacancies on the advisory bodies? All right, we'll move on to appointments. Um, this was a matter that um, came up in um, our closed session. So I don't know if there's any discussion or whether we need to move directly into our motion since we've already had that discussion. So um, we have um, two vacancies on the CPS MT, and I'll look to Ryan Wolf. Thank you, Chair. And I do have a motion. I move the council appoint Dr. Brittany Schwartzkopf to the National Marine Fisheries Service position on the Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team currently held by Dr. Kevin Hill and appoint Ms. Taylor DeBevick to the NIMS position on the CPS MT currently held by Mr. Josh, Joshua Lindsay. All right, and that language on the screen is accurate and complete. It yes. appears, so look for a second, seconded by Pete Hassemer. Please speak to your motion as necessary. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, Dr. Schwarzkopf has a PhD in fishery science from Oregon State and has been working at the Southwest Center on CPS aging issues and we think should be a fantastic addition uh, to the CPS MT. Uh, and as Mike noted, I did want to reiterate, Dr. Hill has been a member of the management team for 25 years, was on the SSC for eight and chaired the SSC for two. So just wanted to echo um, really heartfelt thanks to Dr. Hill for his extensive years of service providing the MT with stock assessment support. Ms. Debevic has been working for the Sustainable Fisheries Division of the region, uh, initially as a contractor and then as a federal employee since 2014. And ever since she started, she's been engaged within the council process, uh, working for the agency on HMS, CPS, and now marine planning matters. Um, she's developed EFPs, rulemaking packages, proposals to international bodies, and done a number of other uh, related analyses. And, also recently supported CPS management doing our specs packages for sardine and mackerel. Um, so I think it should be a great addition to that team. <clears throat> and I do wanna take a moment to also 
echo Mr. Berner's comments from the overview regarding Mr. Lindsay, thanking him for his extensive service on mm -hmm. the management team and all of his contributions, expertise and insight on CPS. Uh, and I'll note that while <clears throat> we're losing Dr. Hill, uh, Mr. Lindsay from the management team, and they're not gonna completely disappear from the council process. And Dr. Hill will help out as much as he can uh, on various issues. And, and you will very likely be seeing uh, Mr. Lindsay in the chair that I'm occupying right now uh, at future meetings. Uh, and with that, that concludes my remarks. Thank you very much. Is there any discussion on this motion? If not, I will call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much for the motion. We'll move next to uh, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife position on the Habitat Committee, and I'll look to Heather Hall. Thank you, Chair Grelnick. I move the council appoint Ms. Laura Brown to the WDFW position on the Habitat Committee, currently held by Ms. Randy Thurston. Is there a second? Seconded by Butch Smith. Please speak to your motion. Thank you. Uh, I am pleased to nominate uh, Ms. Brown as the WDFW representative on the Habitat Committee. Um, Ms. Brown works in our department's habitat program as the restoration coordinator, um, coordination manager for the Lower Columbia River. Um, her responsibilities include working with the Columbia River Basin policy and science leads to develop and implement and manage large scale aquatic restoration efforts throughout the Lower Columbia River. Um, I think uh, Ms. Brown is gonna uh, be an excellent representative for the department on the Habitat Committee. I, I also want to acknowledge um, Ms. Brandy Thurston's time on the Habitat Committee since 2016. She has been an effective and valuable representative um, on that committee for, for the department, and we really appreciate her uh, contributions to the committee and the council process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any discussion on this motion? Uh, not seeing any, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Uh, we now have uh, need need to fill a vacancy on the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife position on the model evaluation workshop, and I'll look to Maggie Summer. Thank you, Chair. I move the council appoint Ms. Emily Shallow to the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife position on the model evaluation work group. Thank you, Maggie. That language looks complete. And look for a second, seconded by Krista Svensson. Please speak to your motion. Thank you, Chair. Ms. Shallow has a Master's of Science in Oceanography and Coastal Sciences from the University of Louisiana. She brings expertise in biology, ecology, uh, as well as data analysis and modeling. She's currently supporting, uh, providing technical support for Oregon's ocean salmon managers, and we look forward to her contributions to the model evaluation work group in this forum. Thanks. All right, thank you. Is there any discussion on this motion? I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. So that completes our motions. And I think it completes our action here, but let me look around the table and see if anyone uh, has anything else they want to take up under this agenda item. Uh, Mr. Berner, how are we doing? We're doing great. Thank you, Chair Grelnick. We will move forward with the four uh, appointments that you just made. We will also open up um, for nominations uh, two positions, one on the a tribal representation on the Habitat Committee and the at-large position on the GAP. I'll leave those other three for your discussion and consideration in June. Uh, and we will look for some further discussion regarding a potential ad hoc committee to deal with stock definitions in, in the ground fish world. Uh, but that'll for, be for your June meeting. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Mike. That brings us to our final agenda item of this meeting, which is future meeting agenda and workload planning. And we have a number of reports, but I'll go to Merrick 
for an overview. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, council members. Uh, so this is agenda item H3, future council meeting agenda and workload planning. So the purpose of this agenda item is to uh, take a look at our plan over the next year, and then especially for June, uh, make refinements and, and give us some guidance about how you would like to structure those meetings. I would like to call your attention to a few things that you have available to you as part of this agenda item. So one, uh, to start with, you have the original a year at a glance summary and the uh, proposed council meeting agenda. Those two have been modified as we have gone through the week and heard your discussion. So you now have supplemental a year at a glance and uh, proposed meeting agenda for June. You also have a supplemental SSC report, an EWG report, a CPSMT report, a CPSAS report, an MPC report, a GMT report, and I believe you have two public comments. I would like to maybe just take the liberty to walk through a bit of the year at a glance and the uh, in the June agenda while I have the mic, Mr. Chairman. Certainly. Uh, so starting with the year at a glance summary, um, looking at June, of course, that is a very uh, heavy ground fish uh, uh, meeting, uh, planning on a uh, meeting in Vancouver. I would note uh, uh, as part of this discussion, we have been making plans to meet at a full in-person council meeting in June. So I believe that would be appropriate for that to be part of this discussion and to hear your affirmation of that plan or not. Moving through September, um, of course, we start to pick up more highly migratory species and we start to come back on some salmon matters, uh, especially concerning things like the methodology review and other things we've taken up this week. Moving to November, uh, we have more CPS matters, also another ground fish meeting uh, HMS matters, um, a few other things as well. Those meetings are already uh, getting quite full as you can, as you can see. Um, and as we look out about a year from now, um, at the last council meeting, we did not yet have dates for the March and April meetings. We have, um, pinned those down. I would flag those for you. They are, uh, the time period between them is always short and next year will be a little bit shorter because of the Easter holiday. Um, that will undoubtedly pinch our salmon process a bit. Um, we've spoken to the SSC and the SDT and others about that, but I did want to flag that for you. Let's see, looking more specifically then at the June meeting. Um, so of course, the June meeting is a very ground fish heavy meeting. Uh, we have several matters uh, where we are planning to take up several hours um, concerning ground fish. So one of course are the 23, 24, our ground fish specifications. We have that plan for two days um, to give you time to first hear the agenda items and the reports and then uh, some time to formulate uh, motions and decide how to move forward. We also have another uh, very heavy uh, item concerning sablefish gear switching. Uh, that also is uh, straddles two days to um, uh, hear the uh, the information concerning that agenda item and to spend some time formulating motions and what have you. Um, we have several um, items that are shaded. Uh, one is marine planning. As we've talked about this as staff, um, uh, BOEM has re recently reached out to us and would like to try to schedule a joint uh, council BOEM meeting concerning the Oregon call areas in particular in May, I believe it was. Um, so we will have some matters there to discuss. Um, we think it would be appropriate to move that um, off of the shaded list. Um, of course, uh, one of the questions there is uh, the, the often uh, voluminous number of advisory body comments that we receive on that matter. Um, let's see, some other issues to think through. Uh, we spent some time this, this week talking about electronic monitoring. Um, that has been changed from a two hour agenda item to a one hour agenda item in the shaded box. Um, that one hour would give time for an update uh, from the gem pack and tech as, uh, as those meetings move forward. So uh, Mr. Chairman, maybe I'll pause there. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, again, you do have several reports to work through and some public comment. All right, let's see if there are any questions of the executive director. Um, and then we'll hear reports and then we'll have discussion. So Maggie. 
Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Merrick. I thought I heard you say mention a joint council BOEM meeting in May. Would that be with the Marine Planning Committee or just give us more of a sense of who that would be? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Ms. Summer, for that question. Um, we have not scheduled that yet. We're still in discussions with them, but the plan would be to move forward with uh, that, that noticed as an MPC meeting, yes. Uh, Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, Merrick, in, on the June under Salmon, um, it was my understanding that we would hear back from the STT relative to um, a plan or path forward to resolve, um, hopefully resolve some of the modeling issues that came up during this salmon cycle. Uh, just inquiry about whether that was still the plan. Yes, thank you, Mr. Anderson. That is indeed still the plan. We envision that coming up under the future council meeting agenda and workload planning item. Uh, which is one reason why we have that scheduled for two hours. Um, the way we see that is that, that that agenda item is appropriate to discuss that plan. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Heard any further questions of our executive director? And if not, we'll move forward with uh, a number of reports, number of reports that we have. Uh, and this may be our last call for these reports to be given virtually, I hope. So uh, first, um, we have an SSC report, and I'll ask uh, John DeVore to provide that. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, I just have a note here from John that his power is out. Uh, he's unable to connect. He's uh, hoping Mr. Berner could read that report. If not, I'd be happy to read it as well. Well, I think Mr. Berner can read it. And he'll let us know if he cannot. <laughs> Just give him a moment to find it. Yes. SSC report, correct? Okay. Agenda item H3A Supplemental SSC Report 1. The Scientific and Statistical, Statistical Committee discussed workload planning and has the following updates to our March 2022 statement under this agenda item. The SSC has planned two meetings of the relevant subcommittees to discuss proposed changes to two separate stock assessment terms of reference for ground fish and coastal pelagic species. The SSC Groundfish Subcommittee will meet online on April 22nd to discuss the ground fish terms of reference. And the SSC CPS subcommittee will meet via webinar on May 5th to discuss development of the CPS terms of reference. Members of the ground fish and CPS management teams and advisory sub panels are encouraged to participate in these meetings. The revisions to the terms of reference for ground fish stock assessments is scheduled for final adoption by the council in June of 2022 while revisions to the CPS terms of reference are slated for initial review in June and final adoption in November 2022. The seventh national meeting of the Scientific Coordination Subcommittee of the Council Coordination Committee is scheduled for August 15th through 17th in Sitka, Alaska. The meeting will explore fishery management adaptations to a changing climate. Dr. Andre Punt has been invited to be a keynote speaker and other SSC members anticipated to intend, attend include Drs. Kristen Marshall, Melissa Haltuk, Teresa So, and most likely Galen Johnson and Owen Hamel. The SSC will keep the council apprised of the plans for the SCS7 meeting as they are decided. The SSC recommends convening the annual SSC Ecosystem Subcommittee meeting with the California Current Integrated Ecosystem Assessment Team to review additions to the IEA report on September 7th, the day prior to the full SSC meeting. The SSC also recommends inviting the SSC Salmon Subcommittee, Salmon Technical Team, and Salmon Advisory Subpanel to the September SSC Ecosystem Subcommittee meeting since one of the recommended topics is specifically relevant to salmon management. 
The same topic could be scheduled in the afternoon so that those attending for that topic need only attend for half a day. The SSC requests the council support remote participation of some participants to this meeting due to the limited travel budgets for Science Center IEA staff. The SSC recommends holding the annual salmon methodology review in late September or late October. A specified date is yet to be determined. The SSC ground fish subcommittee is planning several additional meetings and workshops over the next several months. The SSC ground fish subcommittee is planning to meet June 21 through 23 to review the template model builder implementation of a species distribution model to generate biomass indices in combination with a workshop on the treatment of indices for the hook and line survey data from Oregon and California. In order to accommodate the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife field work schedules, WDFW rod and reel survey data and index development will be discussed at a subsequent fall meeting noted below. Pairing the methodology review of the template model builder implementation of a species distribution model to generate biomass indices with the hook and line data and index development workshops will reduce the number of meetings and reports and provide time for proponents to work on requests while other topics are discussed. The SSC Groundfish sub Subcommittee proposes a planning meeting in late July or early August to coordinate aging prioritization and catch estimation to inform the groundfish stock assessments prioritized for review in 2023. The Groundfish Subcommittee proposes conducting a workshop in late August to explore approaches for modeling large closed areas and other regulation changes in upcoming groundfish stock assessments. The Groundfish Subcommittee is busy, recommends a methodology review September 26 through 30 to review Oregon Department and Fish and Wildlife's proposed acoustic ROV survey methodology for semi-pelagic rockfish with the participation of a, of a center of independent expert scientists on acoustic abundance estimation methods. The SSC recommends combining the review of methods for constructing abundance indices based on the Washington hook and line surveys to this meeting to reduce the number of meetings. The groundfish subcommittee of the SSC recommends scheduling a workshop on using ROV data in stock assessments in November or December of 2022 to with the participation of the Center of Independent Expert Scientists. The SSC Groundfish Subcommittee previously proposed a workshop to discuss alternate harvest control rules for spiny dogfish to reflect its lower productivity and the finding from the most recent assessment that the SPR 50% harvest rate may not be sustainable. The SSC recommends postponing that workshop until 2024 due to the lack of data and capacity to make progress on this topic prior to the 2023 stock assessment cycle. And then as you can see on the page of three and four is just a summary of the timing and a little bit more detail about participation uh, for those workshops that they just highlighted, so. All right, thank you, Mike. I won't see if there are any questions <laughs> of you since you did not participate, but there are a lot of very detailed uh, recommendations there in that report. So we'll go next to the ground fish management team, Joe Peterson. Good morning, uh, Chair, um, Vice Chair, and, and member of the Council's Council. Um, I'm Joe Peterson. I'm going to be reading for you today the ground fish management team report on future Council meeting agenda and workload planning. Um, so the ground fish management team reviewed the draft year at a glance and the draft June agenda contained in the advanced reading book as well as the status of ongoing projects and offers the following for consideration by the Pacific Fishery Management Council. Uh, special session, session GMT spring meeting. The GMT has planned a two day virtual meeting in the spring of 2022 on May 23rd and May 24th. The GMT will discuss and conduct analysis needed from the council action taken under agenda items F3 and F4 and will also conduct a pre-council webinar. Meeting in, May, meeting in May will allow the GMT to develop materials to facilitate council discussions and allow for any needed analysis and the formulation of team recommendations to be presented at the June council meeting. Transitioning back to in-person meetings. All members of the GMT agree that it is important for the GMT 
and the Groundfish Advisory Subpanel to meet in person at the June Council meeting. At the June meeting, the Council will take final action relating to the 2023-2024 Harvest Specifications and Management Measures cycle. Efficiencies and communication between Council staff, Council members, the GAP, and GMT members could lead to a more robust discussion of decision points that will shape the groundfish fisheries for the 23-24 biennium. The draft June agenda has several other substantial groundfish items that would also benefit from the in-person interactions and efficiencies. The GMT reminds everyone to take into account travel days when planning briefings or meetings that may be held virtually and that are covering topics of interest across multiple advisory bodies, such as ecosystem and or marine planning. The June agenda. The GMT agrees with the proposed council meeting agenda that the GMT meeting starting one day before the council is scheduled to begin, Wednesday, June 8th. This would allow for two days of publicly noticed team meetings before the council is scheduled for their first ground fish agenda item. This will help facilitate the many complex topics that the GMT will be presenting to the council, most notably agenda item F5, final 2023-2024 exempted fishing permits and management measures. As they typically do, the GMT would like the council to continue considering council and advisory body schedules and do their best to allow for needed revisions to reports based on council guidance and direction received during the June meeting. In previous bienniums, the council and advisory bodies have needed to adapt schedules in order to provide adequate time for advisory body discussions, public comment, and council direction. The GMT anticipates that under the F5 final 2023-2024 exempted fishing permits and management measures agenda item, constituents will be thoroughly engaged leading to higher than usual public comment on that agenda item. The GMT recommends the council and council staff consider the sensitivity of the groundfish items at the June council meeting and carefully consider the length of time that may be needed for each groundfish agenda item. GMT year at a glance. The GMT reviewed the council year at a glance and had some discussion about these items in table one below, acknowledging that many factors and pieces can change between meetings, especially several meetings ahead. The GMT reminds the council that the stock definition item is a high priority for the National Marine Fisheries Service and the critical to the success of future harvest specification cycles. Therefore, the team encourages the council and council staff to consider scheduling the range of alternatives and or preliminary preferred alternative for this item as early as possible after scoping. Noting that the only, the only the scoping item is currently scheduled at the council year to glance. The GMT also reminds the council that our groundfish workload in recent council meetings has reached or exceeded the team's capacity and our workload often includes tracking other non-groundfish items even if not submitting a report. <clears throat> so the following table um, on the next page is a GMT table one um, year at a glance for the June uh, 2022 um, through uh, April um, 2023. <clears throat> if you look at this item, this has the items included in our report above um, and the different shading and italics um, represent um, recommendations of the GMT um, as shown in this document. So and with that, I will answer any questions. All right, thank you very much, Joe. Are there any questions on the, GM, on the GMT report? Mr. Berner. Thank you, Mr. Chair, thank you, Joe. Uh, regarding the June meeting, uh, we do do our best to get the best times and the best line out for the GMT and for the council to get through its ground fish business. I'm just curious, were there any time estimates on the June agenda that you thought were either under or over predicted or were there any specifics that you had there that, that might help us with our June planning? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so really the, the team um, is most concerned around um, time with uh, fisheries and management measures. Uh, that's our most, probably our most important um, and sensitive item. Uh, in our council process that we're doing now, um, meeting virtually um, there's a higher than average i think participation and so i think under that agenda item the team would like to stress having um, 
potentially some more time and some more flexibility with that item. Um, but that was really where the bulk of the discussion focused. Thank you. Any other questions of the GMT? I have a question, Joe. Um, on your table, you indicate that bolded items with strike through indicate those that could be moved to a later date. Um, I'm not seeing any that are noted that way in your table. Am I, am I missing something? No. So um, currently in our table, we do not have any items that we um, were anticipating to remove through and moving to a later date. Um, but keep in mind, um, all of the items that are labeled scoping um, have the potential to be put on um, later council members um, after that item is scoped and prioritized by the council. All right, thank you very much. All right, well, uh, thank you for that report. We'll now go to the CPS management team, Kirk Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair, council members, good morning. Uh, I'll be reading from agenda item H3A, supplemental CPSMT report one. The Coastal Plastic Species Management Team reviewed the draft proposed Pacific Fishery Management Council meeting agenda June 2022 and the Pacific Council Workload Planning Preliminary Year at a Glance Summary. The CPSMT offers the following for council consideration. CPS Essential Fish Habitat Review. The CPSMT anticipates being able to provide the council an action plan for phase two of the EFH review in June 2022 and recommends the council unshade this agenda item for June. To prepare for this and under other CPS agenda items planned for June 2022, the CPSMT will hold an online meeting on May the 4th. Coastal Plastic Species Fishery Management Plan Housekeeping Updates. The CPS FMP would benefit from an administrative or housekeeping amendment to include clarifying relevant portions of Amendments 8, 13, and other amendments, revising operational definitions, improving consistency across sections, making format revisions, and incorporating changes referenced under Agenda Item E4A, CPSMT Supplemental Report 2. The team plans to develop an outline of housekeeping changes over the fall and requests an agenda item be placed on the November Council agenda. The May 4th webinar and a planned fall team meeting will be opportunities to review these updates and progress towards a revised CPS FMP. The fall meeting may also be an opportunity to discuss and prepare for other November 2022 Council agenda items. Future meeting format. The team is in favor of resuming in-person council and advisory body meetings instead of remote meetings whenever possible while retaining appropriate safety protocols as necessary. If in-person meetings can be held, the team favors an option for remote attendance as well if possible. And that concludes our report. And I wanted to take a moment to recognize three long-term or long-time CPS management team members recently attended their last meetings as part of the team. Kim Hill of the Southwest Fishery Science Center was on CPSMT for over 20 years, authored numerous CPS stock assessments, and he served as chair for several years. Josh Lindsay of NIMS West Coast Region has advised and served on the CPSMT for many years, and Lorna Wargo of WDFW has also been with the CPSMT for many years and served as chair as well for several years. I just want to recognize those folks and that the uh, team thanks them for their extensive contributions and wishes them well. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Kirk. Are there questions on the CPSMT report? Thank you, Kirk. We now go to the CPSAS report. Mike Okineski. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Um, Good morning. Mike Okineski, and I'll be reading from agenda item H3A, supplemental CPS AS report one, Coastal Plagic Species Advisory Subpanel Report on Future Council Meeting Agenda and Workload Planning. The Coastal Plagic Species Advisory Subpanel discussed items of importance 
related to future Pacific Fishery Management Council agendas and workload planning. We offer the following comments for your consideration. The CPSAS would like to return to an in-person meeting for June 2022. Number two, if the Marine Planning Committee meets at the June Council meeting or has relevant work for review for this meeting, the CPSAS would like an opportunity to be updated and deliberate on their work and other information regarding the progression of offshore industrialization. Three, as discussed under agenda item E3, the Scientific and Statistical Committee has discussed the importance of conducting workshops related to the assessment of Pacific sardine. That's agenda item E3A, Supplemental Revised SSC Report 1. The CPSAS would like to be kept apprised on the schedule of these workshops, as well as the constructs of formatting, formatting agendas, guests, and topics for review. We recommend having representation from the CPSAS, as well as the management team. These meetings should include members of industry and take into consideration the knowledge of individuals who hunt fish for a living. Number four, essential fish habitat. Currently, CPS EFH phase two is shaded on the June council agenda. The CPSAS would like to participate in and be able to review future work or documents related to EFH. This may not need to be conducted at the time of the council meeting. It could be done virtually prior to the council meeting or even during a council meeting in cases where there are CPS items on the agenda. Uh, thank you and be happy to take any questions. I, I would like to say one thing. I've worked with Kevin now, Kevin Hill and Josh and Lorna for quite some time, at least a decade, uh, two with Kevin, I think. And uh, I really have appreciated their work and dedication. Um, Lorna, well, all three of them, are, they're just st rock stars. So. Uh, we will miss them and wish them the best of luck wherever they go. And I know where Lorna's going, so. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Are there any questions of Mike on the AS report? Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Uh, we'll hear from The Gap, Susan Chambers. Good morning again. Thank you, Good Chair Gorelnik. Good morning. Uh, my name is Susan Chambers, and I will be reading from agenda item H3A, Supplemental Gap Report 1. The Groundfish Advisory pan Panel reviewed the documents under this agenda item and offers the following comments. Referencing the June 2022 Council agenda, the Gap recommends the following. One, unshading and adding the marine planning agenda item to the agenda. This is a critically important issue to members involved in Pacific Fishery Management Council managed fisheries, especially since the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management recently released the Oregon call areas and a formal federal register notice is forthcoming. Additionally, the Ad Hoc Marine Planning Committee plans to meet in late May to help inform the council on issues and letters that have comment periods that coincide with the June council meeting. The GAP believes council could benefit from discussion of these letters and comments during open session, rather than relying on the quick response process. The GAP suggests including a narrowly focused marine planning agenda item for June uh, that would con possibly consist of the Oregon call areas, Olympic wind off of Washington, <clears throat> activities related to the Morro Bay wind energy area and the National Marine Fisheries Service slash Boeing strategy to mitigate offshore wind development on NIMS surveys. We also note there is a likely escalation in the number of events affecting the marine environment and our fisheries. Therefore, we urge the MPC and council to look for ways to make commenting on these issues more efficient. Number two, the GAP supports adding an update on electronic monitoring to the June agenda. Number three, the GAP supports removing the ground fish workload and new management measures item from the council's June agenda. The GMT and council staff 
will have plenty of analyses to do on current ground fish subjects to inform agenda items in June. <clears throat> Regarding the draft year to glance calendar, the GAP recommends one, uh, support scheduling the non trawl RCA range of alternatives slash primary preliminary preferred alternative agenda item for the September Council meeting. This would also necessitate tentatively scheduling a final preferred alternative agenda item in March or April of 2023. Number two, the GAP supports the schedule for electronic monitoring as outlined in agenda item F7, supplemental GEMPAC report one. We suggest adding as shaded items, the selection of a preliminary preferred alternative in September, 2022, and a final preferred alternative in March, 2023. <clears throat> Regarding the transition to in-person meetings, the GAP had a lengthy discussion about the transition from virtual to in-person meetings including some creative options the council and staff may want to consider in the future. The GAP notes council staff quickly adapted to online meetings at the outset of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we thank them for that action. However, the GAP's preference at this time is for an in-person meeting in June while the, while the council considers ways to proceed with hybrid, that is virtual and in-person meetings in the future. <clears throat> It is clear to many GAP members that in-person meetings facilitate better interpersonal communications between GAP members and the groundfish management team and the greater council family. It is important that these discussions can be had, especially when difficult and complex issues are forthcoming. GAP members and members of the public can communicate interests, ideas, and issues for consideration much more easily in direct conversation. Several GAP members noted the North Pacific Fishery Management Council met this week and included a hybrid option. GAP members who participate in both regions remarked on the success of this hybrid process and urges the council to prioritize working on this option into the future for both the council and advisory bodies. It remains important that members of the public be able to listen to the council and provide comment virtually, even if the council is meeting fully in person. We recognize the North Pacific Council has only one advisory panel, whereas the Pacific Council has many advisory bodies. Therefore, the cost and staff resources to do both hybrid council and ABs may be higher, but those issues are surmountable. The GAP also considered other ideas the council may wish to consider. One, semi-virtual meetings. Using the GAP as an example, this would include GAP members who wish to attend a council meeting in person so they can provide GAP reports, public comment, interact with the council and staff, et cetera, but have the GAP meeting itself be run virtually as we have been doing. GAP members would attend from their private hotel rooms. The advantages include some of the personal interaction, but also provides flexibility for GAP members who may not be able to attend in person. The GAP acknowledges there may be issues with high-speed internet connectivity in hotel rooms, but again, that is an issue that could be dealt with. Number two, consider virtual versus in-person meetings for some advisory body meetings, dependent on council actions and to what extent that advisory body's attendance is required. As the virtual option has proven, advisory bodies can adapt to the online venue. However, the council recognized the importance for the salmon advisory subpanel and salmon technical team to meet in person in March and April. It may be possible for the GAP and other advisory bodies to meet virtually for two or three of the five meetings per year, perhaps when those respective ABs have lighter schedules. And finally, the GAP also notes that public participation is a key part of the council and fisheries management process. It has increased during the transition to virtual meetings. The council, the council should keep this in mind as it explores more hybrid or virtual options. Mr. Chair, that concludes my report and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much, Susan. Are there any questions on the GAP report? I'm not seeing any, thank you very much, Susan. But don't go too far away because we now have a report of the Marine Planning Committee and you're designated to provide that. 
Yes, I am. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, again, for the record, my name is Susan Chambers, and I will be reading from agenda item H3A, Supplemental MPC Report 1. The Ad Hoc Marine Planning Committee retreat, reviewed the documents under this agenda item and offers the following comments. Referencing the draft June Council meeting agenda, the committee notes that marine planning is a shaded candidate agenda item for the June meeting. The MPC recommends the council unshade and schedule this item on the June Council agenda. The committee has been working on several issues of importance to the council and its advisory bodies, including offshore wind areas off Washington, Oregon, and California, aquaculture opportunity areas, the U.S. Coast Guard Pacific Port Access Route Study, and more. There are several pending events, such as a California lease auction this fall, that warrant council discussion well in advance. Further, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration AOA comment period is expected to overlap with the June meeting, thereby allowing the council to discuss potential comments in open session. And that concludes my much shorter Marine Planning Committee report, and I am happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Are there any questions on the MPC report? Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Um, if I have a question for her, but don't know if it's appropriate at this agenda item, but if, it, if it's not, let me know and I will defer. Well, if it's about the NPC report. <clears throat> yes. Susan, I know you're one of the co-chairs of the, of the um, committee, and it's been noted many, many times that the committee has members of all of our advisory panels and management teams and such on there. And... Uh, when they meet, then comes with a report, but it also comes with, it seems like every advisory panel and management team as well uh, coming to the council. I certainly, for one, and I've talked to others, did not envision that at the time it was established. Do you have any idea, of, is there a way to truncate that to somewhat to have the committee have the report? And, and go back to the advisory panels to kind of circle it around so that the final report by the committee represents uh, the view of the whole. I mean, I thought that's what I understood it to be to begin with, but it seems like uh, the planning, when we have that on the agenda, it takes an extraordinary amount of time to go through those, and it seems like there might be a way to fix that. Do you have any ideas about that? Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may. Please. Uh, Mr. Grelick, uh, Mr. Dooley, thank you for that question. Um, I know um, we have discussed this, you know, a little bit in the Marine Planning Committee. We've also had that discussion in the Groundfish Advisory Panel because uh, we do recognize that oftentimes the reports from the advisory bodies are lengthy and it does take up a, count, a lot of council floor time. Right now, um, I don't have any uh, quick solutions to that, um, but that is one thing I think the Marine Planning Committee should discuss. Uh, personally, I have tried to, um, you know, reach out to our GAP members to attend the Marine Planning Committee meetings and to provide input, which they have done. Um, I know other uh, Marine Planning Committee members have also reached out to their respective advisory bodies. Um, but that, you know, and those members have also attended Marine Planning Committee uh, sessions. Uh, at this time, I don't have a uh, final solution, but it is something that the Marine Planning Committee should discuss when we meet in May. Um, it's been kind of a hurry up and catch up to all these events that have been uh, coming at us since we were first formed in June. So. Um, I am happy to talk to Mr. Kerry Griffin, the staff, uh, council staff officer on the planning committee and make sure we agendize that and discuss it. Welcome any suggestions from the council to find those efficiencies as well. All right, thank you, Susan. Any other questions on the report given by the MPC? Not seeing any, uh, thank you very much, Susan. We'll now go to the ecosystem work group. Tommy Moore.
Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair, members of council. For the record, um, Dr. Tommy Moore, Vice Chair for the Ecosystem Working Group. And I want to say it's been a pleasure to be able to meet with you here in person to preempt all the folks coming in June. Um, today I'll be reading from agenda item H3A, Supplemental Ecosystem Working Group, Working Group Report 1. In September 2021, the Council considered progress made on the Climate and Communities Initiative and identified follow-up tasks intended to support West Coast fish stocks and fisheries in adapting to climate variability and change. At the Council's direction, the Ecosystem Working Group provided a March 2022 report recommending priorities for the follow-up task based on comments the Council had received from its advisory bodies, the public, and categorizing those tasks by the type of council action needed to implement the task. Agenda item H3A, Supplemental EWG Report 2, March 2022. Priority levels are discussed and further details, excuse me, provided in agenda item H3A, Supplemental EWG Report 2, March 2022. At its March 8th and 9th, 2022 meeting, the EWG discussed reporting regularly to the council's workload planning agenda item so that the council could track its progress implementing the following work or the follow up work from the CCI. While this is a new approach, providing a list of potential tasks for the council's um, discussion of its year at a glance is similar to how the council sets priorities and plans for work under the fisheries management plans. The typical March and September schedule for considering ecosystem agenda items does not always align with individual FMP schedules. Moreover, getting feedback from ABs remains challenging and typically requires considering issues across multiple council meetings. Providing this April 2022 report allowed us to review feedback from, the March, from March in time to update the list of potential CCI follow-up tasks for the council to consider while it is planning work for the remainder of 2022. If the council receives prioritizing or scheduling comments from on CCI tasks from other ABs at this April meeting, the EWG would welcome the opportunity to report back again for the June 2022 future meeting planning discussion. Below, below oh, excuse me, wow. Below, we separate CCI tasks into one reports or other tasks that the council could add to a future agenda without further additional background information from the EWG. Two, reports or other tasks that could be associated with future fishery ecosystem plan initiative or that might require additional background information from the EWG before being added to a future council agenda. And three, reports or other tasks that the council has already completed or assigned for further work. And I will uh, stop there unless council would like me to read in the list of potential tasks. All right, thank you very much. Are there questions on the EWG report? Or any questions about the follow-up tasks? Query writings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks, Dr. Moore, for the report. Um, I enjoyed reading it, appreciated the update on sort of all the pieces that are, are floating around. Um, did you have a discussion about or an idea about if this is sort of something that could be provided at all five meetings moving forward? Is this sort of a mechanism that the EWG was thinking they could just sort of keep the council abreast of what was happening um, on ecosystem items? And, and if this could be something that you would anticipate doing at every meeting? Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, Ms. Writings. I don't recall that we had that detailed of a discussion, but I, um, I do believe that's something we would be amenable to if the uh, council would like us to do so. Thanks. Any further questions on the EWG report? Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just uh, checking in to ensure that you're watching uh, virtually. We do have uh, CDFW folks. You are absolutely would... correct. Thank John you. Ugaritz has a question. I apologize, John. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, actually, I appreciate the ability to seat swap remotely like this. Um, question for the EWG. At the March meeting, the, the council directed the EWG to incorporate the discussions and decisions regarding um, next steps for the initiatives in the FEP appendix 
release them for public and advisory body review and provide a revised FEP appendix for the council in September. I, I don't see that captured in your report under any of the follow-up task categories, including the categories that are listed as already assigned. I just wanna be sure that the EWG has that on your radar and you're planning to meet the timeline directed to you in March. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Ugritz. Uh, that was an oversight by the EWG. We are planning on um, incorporating feedback and meeting the guidance um, or the direction put forward by council. And we've already been working with council staff on scheduling these meetings. Thank you. Anything further from the council on this report? Thank you very much and good to see you in person. Yes, thank you. All right, so let's, I know that completes all the reports and I know we have some public comment here. Two folks, three. So we will start with Teresa Labriola followed by Tara Brock. Welcome, Teresa. Okay, good morning. Thank you, Chair Gorilnik and members of the council. I'm Teresa Labriola, representing Wild Oceans. Um, I have wanted to speak on four of your items today, highly migratory species, coastal pelagic species, ecosystems, and council operations. And so um, first with highly migratory species, looking at your year at a glance, I see the drift gill net hard caps are scheduled for June. And I um, thank you for that. And I encourage you to keep this schedule. The council originally endorsed hard caps in September 2015 and minimizing bycatch in the drift gill net fishery is a priority for many um, representatives, uh, public members of the public and constituents, including the sport fishing community and conservation organizations. Um, we are all concerned about the continued impact of drift gill nets, um, and the impact they can have on our open ocean ecosystem. Um, I see that the drift gill net performance metrics have been postponed from June until November. And uh, I understand there is a fair amount of work that goes along with um, the new updated way of providing the council with uh, regression tree analysis of the um, bycatch and the drift gill net fishery. But I encourage the council to ask the team to provide uh, fishery catch summaries, which are prepared from observer data. Um, the team can provide these from the past two years of fishing to the council to help you inform your decision on hard caps. Uh, the National Marine Fishery Service usually provides the new observer numbers by late spring. Uh, council members can also find this data on the West Coast Region Observer Program website. Um, but I think that the most recent two years of data will be important to your discussion about hard caps. And uh, as you've heard, there have been interactions with humpback whales in the past two years. And I don't want you to take my word for that. But, uh, it's, it's helpful to see the observer data. So any way that could be incorporated into June, uh, I think would be helpful for the public and the council. I also wanna note that while the preliminary preferred alternative for hard caps is scheduled for June, there is no final preferred alternative scheduled on the council's year at a glance. And so I'd like to see that added to the schedule in the second half of this year. Regarding coastal pelagic species, um, I second the management team's recommendation to begin uh, an FMP amendment or housekeeping amendment and to specifically incorporate the anchovy framework into the FMP. As we've discussed during several agendas uh, or council meetings, including agenda E4 um, this week. Right now, anchovy is an outlier in CPS management as the framework is not incorporated into the FMP, but is outlined in council operating procedures instead. Um, also, if I heard, I think it was Mr. Lockhart correctly, NIMS is planning to provide the council with a report on the schedule for um, upcoming science, sardine science workshops. And I don't know if there needs to be a specific place for that on the agenda or if, whether that is wrapped into a NIMS report, but I um, wanna raise my hand and, and look forward to that report in, um, in June. Regarding ecosystems, um, I want to thank the EWG for their report and for helping us all understand how um, ecosystem assignments may be uh, tasked to different management teams. And I think it's helpful 
to provide update reports on assignments during workload planning so the council can see uh, in the future um, what tasks the teams are undertaking in between this sort of March and September ecosystem items because uh, some of these, uh, depending on the uh, next ecosystem initiative, uh, these tasks are not just um, undertaken in the September and March meeting, but may be taken in between. And finally, I really look forward to reviewing the upcoming council report on lessons learned from COVID and possible operational changes. I would like to see the council consider an option and discuss the pros and cons of home, hold, holding some advisory body meetings before council meetings. Um, this would ensure that advisory body input can be fully fleshed out and available prior to council discussions. As we currently operate, um, advisory reports are often finished shortly of head of council discussion. It per, this can preclude the full understanding and consideration by council members and the public on um, advisory body uh, reports. So hosting advisory meetings pre-council that would honor the time that these advisors put into their reports, as well as the public resources used to convene these advisory bodies. And as a member of the public, um, advisory meetings overlap with each other. They overlap with the council meeting and it does preclude members of the public like myself from participating in the process when you have multiple meetings all going on at the same time. So just a, one item that I, I would love to see considered in that report. And thank you so much. I'll take any questions. Thank you very much, Teresa. Are there questions of Teresa? Krista Svensson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Teresa. I have... Uh, HMS question for you, imagine that. Um, on the swordfish monitoring and management plan, um, I know in September, I think it was September, you brought up the idea of a uh, conversation around EFP metrics. And I'm just wondering um, your thoughts on including that as part of swordfish plan um, and, and just revisiting that topic because I, I think it's a really solid one um, and how you see that fitting into HMS here at a glance or specifically that topic where I think it could be a good fit. Thank you, um, Chair Karolnik and Ms. Svensson. I was sitting here this morning thinking about the this idea of developing a um, metrics for EFPs and basically, you know, what do we want EFPs to accomplish? What are we looking for? How do we objectively measure their performance in the future? And um, I was considering saying something, but um, about them, I, you know, we had discussed about a year ago or September, I guess it was, including them in June because they match with exempted fishing permits and um, the June agenda is fully called fully um, occupied um I, I, it may be part of a swordfish management and monitoring plan discussion but i think um i i think that would have to be i don't know better thought out so it didn't get lost in some of the other issues that are often considered during swordfish management and monitoring plans so if i'm if i'm not um, mistaken the Swordfish Management and Monitoring Plan now has some tasks that the council assigned the MT to consider almost three years ago as part of it, plus potentially this idea of exempted fishing permit criteria. Um, so it gets, I think, it can easily get overwhelmed with issues and, and, and get lost. So um, I, I'd welcome a discussion on this. I, I am still interested in seeing um, exempted fishing permit criteria as a as a topic of conversation, but I would want it to be um, considered in a narrow discussion, if I could say that, so that it doesn't get lost and overwhelmed by other, um, maybe more contentious items. Thanks. Thank you. All right, any further questions of Teresa Labriola? Thank you, Teresa. Tara Brock, followed by Jeff Lackey. Welcome, Tara. And Tara, we're not hearing you. There appears to be muted. Here you go. 
Apologies. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Grelnick and members of the Council. Um, good morning. My name is Tara Brock with Oceana. I'll be speaking to uh, several items on the upcoming agendas and workload planning. Uh, first, uh, relevant to coastal pelagic species, uh, we request the Council schedule an FMP amendment to incorporate the anchovy management framework and bring anchovy management into compliance with the law, including a regular specifications process. Uh, we view this as a priority that needs to be scheduled uh, in addition to the CPSMT's proposed housekeeping amendment. And we also support the anchovy assessment review in June and look forward to that item and appreciate the work going into that. Uh, we also support the scheduling of a sardine workshop uh, to both identify a new EMSY given the current approach is invalid and to review the sardine stock structure. And sounds like that work might be ongoing and we look forward to council staff working with the center and the SSC CPS subcommittee to make that happen. Turning to highly migratory species, we continue to request the council schedule an FMP amendment to sunset drift gillnet permits in line with the California State Transition Program. In the meantime, we support the council moving forward with hard caps at the June meeting, but uh, as Ms. Labriola pointed out, we do recommend the council also schedule the bycatch performance report for the June meeting, as that information is relevant to the hard cap discussion. Last year, as you heard, the drift gillnet fishery took two humpback whales, but this information was not relayed to the council in a timely manner. It is vitally important that the council have accurate information and there not be a delay in reporting the most recent bycatch data so the council can make informed decisions on the management of the drift gillnet fishery. Uh, lastly, on ground fish, we want to thank the council for including the 2000 metric ton by bycatch trigger for short belly rockfish in the 23-24 management measures and look forward to final action on that in June. In addition to that action, we request the council schedule scoping of an FMP amendment to prohibit directed fishing on short belly rockfish. Uh, and we look forward to working with the council advisory bodies and other stakeholders on that issue moving forward. And finally, we thank the council for your commitment to protecting sensitive habitats with the repeal of the cow cod conservation areas and non trawl RCA modifications. And we look forward to continuing to work with fishery representatives, the council, and advisory bodies to meet our goals of protecting habitat while providing additional fishing opportunities with the selection of PPAs in September. And with that, I will take any questions and thank you for the time. Tara, thank you very much for your comment and suggestions. Are there any questions of Tara? Thank you very much, Tara. And uh, last but certainly not least, Jeff Lackey, welcome. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, council members, for your time. My name is Jeff Lackey. I will speak on the future direction of council and advisory body meeting format relative to in-person and virtual meetings. There was a robust discussion in the gap on this subject with many members speaking up. My impression of the two major themes of those opinions are, first, the people want to get back to in-person meetings. And second, people want the hybrid option for both council and gap meetings in the future. Uh, my impression of the reasons for so supporting the hybrid option generally fell into two categories. The first is it supports gap member participation. Several gap members are small boat and small business people, for which taking five weeks out of their year is a strain on running their businesses, especially during certain fishing seasons and business projects. The hybrid option would allow GAP members to be in person when possible, but participate remotely in some weeks while still attending to their businesses. This would also allow GAP members that have to miss in-person participation of one meeting to continue to stay up to speed on GAP proceedings. Many of these small business GAP members also live hours away from major airports and travel is an additional burden on their time and their businesses. And the second reason, for supporting the hybrid option is that it supports public participation. Virtual meetings have allowed public participation not only in ease of ability to provide testimony that benefits the council process, but also for stakeholders to listen in to the gap 
and be more informed about the council and fishery issues and facilitate their communication between stakeholders and their rep on the gap. A hybrid option would allow these benefits to the public participation component of the council and AB process to continue. There are answers to all questions on how to facilitate hybrid options for the gap. The North Pacific's already doing it, it can be done. If it is a cost issue, then one gap meeting in the future could be made virtual and those savings would pay for upfront cost. There are technical details that need to be worked out and maybe a hybrid gap won't be ready for June and that's okay. But technology exists to facilitate this in the near future. Uh, and that concludes my remarks. Thank you, Jeff. Are there any questions of Jeff? All right. Thank you very much, Jeff, for your comment. And that concludes public comment on H3. Um, we'll next go to our council uh, discussion and action, but we'll take a 15 minute break and we'll be back at uh, 946 and hope to wrap this up.
All right, welcome back. Uh, we have completed reports and public comment on agenda item H3. And so we will now move to our discussion and action. And for that, I will ask our executive director to take the lead. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, what I think would be helpful here is to, uh, since we have, do have a few questions to work through, which I would um, couch as one is the format for June, uh, two is the agenda for June, and three would be the year at a glance. Um, I would suggest that we start by looking at the um, June agenda and clarify that, and that may, may have some bearing then on uh, some discussion about the format, the best format for June, if there is the need for a discussion there, and that that should then tee up uh, a discussion of year to glance as number three. So um, unless there's any objection to that, maybe what I'll do is get us started in looking at the June agenda. Um, again, you do have two of them in your briefing book. I'll be looking at the supplemental one that's been modified here over the, over the course of the week. So in looking at that agenda, <clears throat> what you'll see is that Wednesday we start off with a few advisory bodies. Um, and in particular, um, I, I would ask you to keep in mind the groundfish heavy nature of our June agenda item. So we do have the gap in the GMT in particular starting early. Uh, we also have the CPSAS, CPSMT, the SSC, the, the EC, and the Legislative and Budget Committees. So we move into Thursday. Um, we will have had a Council Coordination Committee meeting um, in May, and so we'll be reporting on that. Um, we also do have this issue of the financial disclosure and recusal policy, and in speaking with General Counsel, this will start to become a standing item that we'll do once a year. We also then have um, the need to modify potentially our COPs as part of that recusal policy. So we envision this coming back uh, in September also. And this would, uh, in June, would provide a briefing of that, of that item. Uh, we then have habitat issues um, and, and uh, coastal pelagic species issues. I would maybe look to Mr. Wolf here. Uh, he did um, make note in an earlier conversation about making sure that the uh, that CSNA assessment um, would be ready in time for the June meeting. I believe that's correct, but just uh, looking to him. Um, and then we have uh, the assessment terms of reference, preliminary action. Um, and there, there's been some talk of potentially lumping the coastal pelagic species EFH uh, in uh, under that item as well not sorry not that item but following that item so the efh cps efh item is shaded in our mini box and there's been some thought about uh, potentially moving it around um, right after uh, e2 moving on to friday um, we then have um, workload and management measures update there is some talk in the the gap statement about potentially removing that item uh, we also then have limited entry fixed gear program review and stock assessment and plan in terms of reference. So that would be a final action. <clears throat> we uh, spoke um, uh, internally last night about the stock definitions issue. Uh, we, we thought that this might be a good place to bring that up would be uh, Friday if we wanted to put that on our agenda for June. Um, and that would involve some of our earlier discussion about whether to create a committee, um, what that committee might be made up of. Um, that of course wouldn't happen there. There'd be membership appointments, but then there's also the question of scoping. And so perhaps all of those come together, uh, perhaps not, but uh, that's one idea. And then moving into Saturday, um, we have stable fish gear switching update. And I would just uh, reiterate that we see this breaking itself into two days. So starting off Saturday, um, uh, similar to some of the agenda items we did this week, where we would go through um, staff summaries, um, advisory body reports, presumably public comment, and then come back <clears throat> the following day to pick up action on that item, letting it percolate uh, through the evening and afternoon um, of Saturday so the motions are ready uh, on Sunday. And then we have um, EFPs on, 
on Saturday as well under F6. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat this morning. <clears throat> Let's see, and then moving over to Sunday, um, we have a few matters here um, on HMS. So NIMS report, um, there was some talk about that potentially not needing a full hour as you have on your uh, supplemental agenda, and maybe that could go more quickly. Um, we also have international management activities, and presumably we'd look to uh, Ms. Svensson to provide an update on um, things of that nature. Um, EFPs and then drift gill net hard caps uh, scheduled for three hours. Thank you, sir. Um, there was some talk internally that perhaps that could be reduced down to two hours if necessary. And then finishing the day with the sable fish gear switching update, um, we would be looking for motions at that time. Um, so then just quickly uh, moving through Monday and Tuesday, so that would involve uh, finishing, uh, let's see here, sorry, groundfish F6, uh, looking at um, our specs items, um, that would be uh, also, something I failed to note, that would be broken into two parts. So the first part would be Saturday, and we would come back Monday for motions, um, and then in-season adjustments to follow. Um, and then if we were to put uh, marine planning on our agenda, this might be the day we would look to do that. Um, and then on Tuesday, we have uh, relatively similar things, uh, fiscal matters. We do have an outstanding budget question that uh, Patricia and I are continuing to noodle on that we would bring back to you um, in June for final decision on our operating budget. Uh, I would envision us having some legislative matters at that point. A um, couple of council meeting records for a couple of meetings and then issues with membership appointments and then a future council meeting agenda. So again, um, we do have some things here in our little box. So marine planning, we have some ideas about where we would put that. We have research and data needs. Um, that's not a time sensitive matter. Um, so if we need some time, we can uh, continue to leave that off if necessary. Uh, coastal pelagic species, uh, my understanding is that uh, the Science Center has already secured a, a contractor on this and that it is uh, moving forward and that it will continue to move forward whether or not it's on our agenda or regardless of whether it's on our agenda in June. And then we have groundfish electronic monitoring. And as uh, Mr. Anderson indicated earlier this week, um, uh, it would probably be appropriate to have a, at least an update on how the GEMPAC and TAC have been doing uh, between now and the June meeting. So I'll pause there and maybe look to Mr. Berner to see if he has anything more to add on that June meeting summary. Uh, thank you, Chair Gronick. Uh, Merrick Burden, thank you. Uh, I guess the only thing I would add is it's been pointed out to me that it seems a little misleading that there's only 0.7 hours available floor time. I guess assuming if the council is okay with a five and a quarter day on uh, day last, uh, we would probably have a two hour block then to fill in uh, on one of the days prior to day last and as uh, Director Burden pointed out, I, I do think the idea of moving stock definitions to immediately follow the stock assessment plan in terms of reference would make some sense. Uh, and that would free up a couple hours on that Monday the 13th to potentially slip in a marine planning update for a couple of hours. So um, I think it was a good overview. I just had that little piece. Thank you. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I guess I, I'd be happy to pause here and entertain discussion or feedback from you all on, on the June plan. Uh, I'm also happy to keep going, but it may be, have, may be wise to have some discussion at this point. Well, I see a hand up already, Phil Anderson. Uh, thanks. Um, two things. Um, Ryan and I were talking offline here about the electronic monitoring update um and originally we had had this on here with the idea that there was some potential of scoping an amendment but in further thinking about this um and hoping i don't run afoul of my fellow committee members um i think i don't think we need to have this agendized as a for june I think we could, if there's a report to be had, we could include it as an informational report and you could, you know, read about it. Um, 
because we, we have a lot of work to do before we get and we have something really substantive to bring back and include in a report. So that's my my thought and recommendation is that we not try to squeeze that in and because um, I think um, September will be the time when we really have some something substantive to bring in an ROA and those kinds of things. That's number one. Number two is, a, is a quest, question. We have Sablefish gear switching. Um, uh, the the term, terms that we're using to characterize what we're doing there is an update. And I'm um, just curious, what what is it we're trying to accomplish with uh, Sablefish gear switching? Um, obviously, we we envision it to be a meaty topic we've got it five hours uh, but in my mind it doesn't take five hours to do an update so i'm assuming that we're going to try to do something we're going to try to make some substantive progress and so is is what's envisioned in terms of what we're trying to accomplish with our five hours on this item in june yeah, thank you, Mr. Anderson. We we have had uh, some internal discussion about what to call that, and I, maybe Mr. Berner recalls those discussions better than I do, and I, I would ask him to weigh in on your question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Director Grelnick, uh, excuse me, that's been a long week. Director Burden, um, perhaps the update is not the quite uh, the right term for that. Uh, I do know that um, in some discussions with Dr. Seeger, there is quite a few questions that he has for the council, so... Uh, perhaps part of the mismatch here is just that my use of the word update in this quick reference. Um, I'm not sure if Jim is on the line, but uh, he, I know he's got a lot of thoughts and uh, several topics he'd like some feedback on. I don't feel like my depth of experience with this gear switching item is is good enough to to tell you exactly what those are, to be to frankly honest. But um, perhaps I think the only uh, mismatch here is my use of the word update here could be the mismatch. Thank you. Ryan. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I have some additional comments, but I think to that last point, uh, perhaps similar to what we had for this meeting, maybe an agenda item of revised uh, ROA would be more appropriate for the gear switching. And I'll stop there to see if there's additional comments on this before I raise my hand for a, other comments on the calendar. Right, I know you had your hand up for some other things. So with regard to this one particular agenda item, F5, is that ROA? Maggie? Thanks, Chair. Uh, yes, it's been my understanding that um, what is needed uh, is at least some council clarification on some elements of the previously adopted alternatives. And so that, um, uh, and that's needed in order to um, enable staff to move forward with analysis. And so to me, that that does um, make it a, a revision of the range. Uh, we may want to consider uh, it, messaging around that um, would not, I, at least it would not be uh, my hope that we would be, you know, entertaining entirely new proposals for alternatives or um, really broadening things beyond where we are. I think the the intent is just to uh, provide that necessary clarity. Krista. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I have a few statements on this topic. Uh, firstly, we did and have on a number of occasions um, told the public that we would allow additional range of alternatives potentially. So I think if uh, this is the time, then the June meeting, if we're going to scope that, really needs to be when they bring those in. Um, that probably does mean a five-hour meeting if, if that's what we're really looking at. The other portion of this that I want to talk about for a minute, um, and I was going to bring it up at the last meeting, but we were all so civilized that I thought, oh, I'm not, not going to be uh, the one that brings it up. Um, 
I feel like this topic is a really sticky wicket. Um, we obviously have been using honey because the fly that I see has to do with um, the SAMTAC committee and, and how that is working. So currently this topic is uh, at the council. Um, I know we have had at least one email that has gone out to SAMTAC members, not the full council. And that is concerning as somebody who wasn't even eligible to be on the SAMTAC because that committee was formed before I was a council member. Um, I'm not suggesting that I want to be on the a gear switching or SAMTAC committee or that we even need one, but I do think that um, it is appropriate for communication coming from staff or interested parties to be going to all council members on this topic. Um, if we do decide that we need a committee, and again, I'm not recommending it, I don't know that we do need one, we gave a final report. Uh, the original SAMTAC was geared to look at a number of different items. Uh, ultimately, we chose gear switching as the important one that we were going to focus on, but we did not change the membership of that committee. And so we have a number of committee members um, who are non-voting that come out from south of 36. They would not be impacted, particularly because gear switching as a topic is fo focused on north of 36. And I'm not saying that they're not invested. I'm not saying they're not knowledgeable, but I do think that we need to really look at the formation of that committee if we're going to use the committee moving forward. And at this time, um, again, I, I just think that it's really important uh, that this is a council topic and that, that communication should be going to all of us. All right, thank you. So I, I guess I, I heard two things there, one, has to do with how we describe this agenda item F5, and I guess we'll leave it to council staff to capture that. And the other, I think you're suggesting that we should add something to our um, membership appointments to discuss the composition of the SAMTAC. Do I have that right? Well, either, I, I mean, my recommendation would be either we dissolve the SAMTAC uh, because we're not looking at SAMTAC items. If we want to reconstitute the committee, we would have a gear switching committee at that point and identify the appropriate members for that. Um, but yeah, others obviously probably will feel differently, but I do think no matter what, it is appropriate to have um, committee members that are representative of what the current issue is, not the range of issues that that committee started with. But that's not something we'd take them under F5. No. Phil, I think you're... Um, the SAMTAC um, provided the council its final report in June of 2021, right? That, do I have the year right? I know I have the month right. Um, and we haven't met since then, obviously, since we provided our final report that was in response to the assignment we were given by the council, which was a coastwide look at sablefish and gear switching and all that stuff. So I'm a little confused about, I mean, it's still on the books. If you go and look at the council roster, it's still there. So I guess it would be available to, if the council wished to use it again for, for another purpose and give it another assignment, which it has not done. But we've provide, we did our work, we provided our report, and absent the council directing a, the SAMTAC to do something else, and, and if it did, it could, of course, revisit the composition of the committee. But that's the status of the, of the SAMTAC and its assignment that, and the, the assignment that it was given by the council from my, from my chair. Merrick? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I, I believe I have created this confusion. Um, so uh, leading into the March meeting, I think it was, must have been the March meeting, 
um, Mr. Seeger was assembling some videos to try to explain the different permutations of, of, of things that we're grappling with on this gear switching issue. And in the interest of um, getting the word out to folks, um, he and I had a conversation and I said, do we have a committee that works on this? And the answer was, well, the SAMTAC is the closest one. And I said, well, let's send it out to the SAMTAC committee then, and then we'll put it um, into the briefing book as an informational item. And I believe my guidance to Mr. Seeger triggered some of this, this confusion and it should have gone to the entire council. So for that, I apologize. I, I think the lesson is learned here. Um, and I'll just chalk that up as a rookie mistake. And uh, hopefully that addresses some of the confusion that's here on the floor. All right, thank you. So um, I think we've addressed F5, uh, but maybe not Corey Niles. Yeah, just quickly, Mr. Uh, Chair, I think my understanding is, is um, much the same as Maggie's on what, what, what the hope of council staff is for June as, as one of the uh, makers of the motions we passed then. There has been a number of questions um, asked and, and yeah, Krista, the intent is, I think, just to bring those questions to the full council and make sure they're, they're fully laid out and um, prepared. So I, the other, every question I've seen will be coming to the, to the full council in June. But on what Krista said about opening the range of alternatives, I would, and maybe these there are things that can be captured in the situation summary, but my take, and if there's other views, please, of course, uh, um, those, are, those are to be expressed, but we did take a big narrowing of the alternatives, not a big narrowing, but we did go from three alternatives to two. So in terms of, I was envisioning would be refinements, tweaks to the two alternatives we have rather than bringing in the whole new alternatives. But as Chris has said, yeah, if, if we're to open it, that's that's um, a potential we'll, we'll hear about. But just wanted to voice that. I, th I think we were trying to focus uh, the public and everyone on those two alternatives and the pieces within them um, and not open it fully up back to, to, to new alternatives, uh, full alternatives. Thank you, Corey. All right, so let's see what other comments we have from the council on our June agenda. Ryan, you're ready for your next comment? Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to support Phil's comments regarding electronic monitoring um, and put that more on September for the YAG when we get there, um, but reiterating the commitment of the work that's going on in the GEMPEC and those subgroups that will obviously be working hard between now and through June and into September. Um, I did want to, uh, maybe I'll start we're going to lift her right here on on CPS issues. There was a mention in public comment about an update from NIMFS on Saturday and Science. Just wanted to let the council know we were planning to do that, or at least the last time I talked to the center under what would be E2, that terms of reference agenda item. Um, it's a little clunky, but I think we could update there. Uh, alternatively, if you wanted to find 30 minutes somehow we could i guess create an imps report under cps but i don't think it's needed i think we could do it under e2 um for ground fish um support moving up dock definitions uh to friday um, and then allowing marine planning potentially to go in there on that monday i do think having marine planning at the end of the week um giving all the advisory bodies time would be good and i think stock definition scoping follows nicely from the stock assessment um, agenda item uh, and i would support the gap request to, to remove the workload and new management measure update um, of course defer to the council but at least nims would support that request uh, and did want to acknowledge um, the gmt report uh, and would support from nims perspective the some direction that the DMT prioritized the harvest specs and the stock definitions, stock assessment discussions uh, over other items as needed. Um, and then if, if, if we did remove the workload uh, and new management measures with that hour, uh, Williams would support putting on the CPS EFH phase two. I think we're ready for that. Uh, and, would, and while that could be potentially delayed. I, I think we have an hour that we could fill and, and that would be our next uh, priority there to put in if that's acceptable. 
Um, and then f uh, finally on hard caps, <clears throat> um, I do, I do have some concerns that I've raised in the past about making sure the council has the level of analysis that it needs to support, especially a preliminary preferred alternative or a final preferred alternative. Um, so I do have some doubts of whether or not we'll have that to select a PPA at that meeting. However, I'm okay with the way, with keeping it as a possibility or at least the way it's proposed here to potentially revise the ROA um, with a maybe being able to do a PPA in particular because I think um, that uh, the um, there is some things that could uh, it would be useful for the MT to get from the council in June. I think it's very useful for the council to consider the model inputs and the initial results there, which may lead to some uh, potential changes or suggestions on those fronts to um, revise the ROA. So. That's just a longer-winded statement of saying I, I support having the hard caps where they are, um, just noting some caution for what might happen. And I think that, and, and then I support your remark, um, uh, Mr. Burden, regarding the potential for postponing the research and data needs, uh, as opposed to trying to find a way to fit, because I think with the suggestions I just made that would occupy the bulk of our time and cognizant of Mike's comments that we are at still at five hours on day last. Uh, and I'll stop there. All right, thank you, Ryan. Uh, Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to comment on the <coughs> EM update that shaded. And I, I agree with uh, Phil and, and Ryan's assessment there with, with one caveat, uh, that would be understanding that we have enough time between now and our um, final decision on this to promulgate the res any any rule changes that might be contemplated. And that was the that was the concern about this to begin with. And I think uh, I'm I'm comfortable with their uh, assessment of that. You did see in the in the Jim Pack, Jim Tack report that was given um, that there are a lot of balls in the air right now. There's a lot of decisions to be made, a lot of work to be done, like when uh, Phil had outlined. <clears throat> but I just uh, want to make sure we have the the number of meetings it would take if we have regulatory changes to make, and that we can get it on the on the ground by uh, 2024, as as contemplated. So that's my only concern. But I think we're okay. So I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Bob. Corey Ridings. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to add to Ryan's thoughts um, on bringing more information to the hard caps discussion um, to start. Definitely support seeing that continued in June. Um, building off some of the public comment we heard this morning. Um, if it would be possible for NOAA to provide the DGN a sort of a fishery catch summary for the 2020-2021 and 2021-2022 fishing seasons. Um, information would include, um, comes from the observer program and includes sort of uh, bycatch numbers um, by species, including marine mammals, sea turtles, seabirds, um, as well as number of sets observed and the total fishing effort for the season. I think that this information could be helpful for the HMS MT as well as the council discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Corey. Krista Svensson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just want to put it out there that I think uh, international management at NOWR may go quite a bit longer, um, possibly on the NIMS report as well. So we've got. Um, ICAT Northern Committee and a number of items coming forward in the summer months. Um, we had a management strategy evaluation meeting for Northern Pacific Albacore as an example. Um, and the next touch in point that was recommended there was coming to the council meeting. So I would expect some stakeholders to come uh, vocalize what their preferences may be for that. Um, but also with regard to Pacific Bluefin, there's some stuff brewing on that. There have been a number of, couple of workshops, excuse me. Um, that have either happened or are ongoing. So um, just for all of us to be aware that that 
both of those could be a little bit of a run over more than the normal hour we take. All right, thanks for that, Krista. Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Really just a question on the plan to schedule uh, marine planning on Monday. Um, I'm just checking in on the um, team meeting plans for the ad hoc marine planning committee. Um, I see in the gap report that there's a plan for the committee to meet in late May, but would there be a plan for that committee to meet uh, in preparation for the floor session on the 15th, 13th, sorry, I can't see. Um, yeah, thank, thank you for the question, Ms. Yuremko. Um, there, there are a couple of things that are, we're still working on settling out with the Marine Planning Committee. So, so one is they, they did have a, a recent meeting and they plan to put together the May meeting that I believe you're referencing. Since that time, Boehm reached out to us and said, can we put something together in the Oregon call area? So we may try to mesh both of those things together. Uh, we're still uh, having some conversations about, about that. I believe your question was, would they have time to meet again, maybe at the meeting or immediately prior to the meeting? Was that your question? Well, yeah, I think that's my question. And I'm just curious if there's a plan yet, um, recognizing that these members of the MPC are also members of the GAP and the HMS AS. And so I'm just curious because those team meetings are scheduled. Mm -hmm. So just wanting to make sure there wasn't going to be a problem. Um, yeah, if I understand correctly, we, we have not envisioned a MPC meeting happening um, concurrently with some of the other advisory bodies. I think that, that would, of course, be very taxing on those folks that are trying to double do double duty. So that, that has not been the plan. If there is a, there's something that you're getting at in particular, we'd be happy to entertain something. But Thank you. No, I, I just was curious. I, I, I didn't know because the MPC didn't speak to it in their report. So I was just curious. Thank you. Further, uh, Ryan Wolf. Yeah, sorry. One thing I forgot, um, just another point in support of marine planning on the June agenda. Um, it, we are projecting the programmatic EIS for the aquaculture opportunity areas to publish at the end of May. So the comment period will overlap with the June council meeting. So that's just another, another reason, um, in addition to your points on BOEM, uh, Merrick, that uh, we would support having it on the June agenda. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Corey. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. And just Ryan, earlier you said uh, you made a statement. I just, I just want to um, on the when sardine information about the sardine workshops and science would come back and whether that would come under E2 or something different. I just want to make the comment. Don't have a preference where, but definitely wanted to support you all doing that. And, and thank you. All right, well, I guess at this point, I'll turn back to our executive director to see how he has synthesized all of the comments we've received and where we are. That's a high bar, Mr. Chairman, um, but thank you. Um, I, I do think we have uh, some good uh, guidance from you all. Um, I would also look at Mr. Berner here and see uh, where his head is at. Um, I think as I look at all my scribbles here, I think we have something that's workable. Let me see if I can summarize this. So um, on Thursday, um, what we'd be looking to do is, um, let me see here. So Thursday looks relatively unchanged. Um, Friday, as I go through Friday, um, we would unless there's guidance to the contrary, look to strike F2, um, add stock definitions to Friday. And if we do proceed with striking F2, we would add E3, which would be the coastal pelagic species EFH. On Saturday, um, let's see here, the sablefish gear switching, we'll couch that as something 
along the lines of revised range of alternatives. Um, and that would include, um, I guess, revising the alternatives and Ms. Fenson's point that we have been communicating to folks that this would also be a time if folks wanna ask for other alternatives, um, we would notice, notice it appropriately. Um, let's see here, moving to Sunday, uh, there was talk about um, making sure the NIMS report includes the catch summary from 2020 to 2021. I believe that would mean that that report would not be shortened. It would probably be a full hour. Maybe I look at Mr. Wolf for affirmation on that, if that's the case. Um, and then international management, Ms. Fenson did make note of uh, several items that would uh, create um, the need to bump that up beyond an hour. Hour. The actual time isn't clear to me at the moment, but uh, we can do some more digging there. Uh, drift gillnet hard caps, we had talked about reducing that to two hours, so that may create space to increase international management. And then we come back to Sablefish gear switching. Um, let's see, and then Monday, uh, let's see here. So we would have struck stock definitions from Monday we would add marine planning. And then Tuesday, um, relatively unchanged, although I would note that um, at the end of Tuesday, the future council meeting agenda item, that is where we would be discussing the FRAM model. I'm not quite sure what to call them, corrections or something, the investigation there and the plan forward. Looking at Mr. Berner to see what else he has here. Uh, thank you. Not much. I thought that was a pretty good summary. Just then looking at the candidate box, uh, I guess the last thing I would cover is that uh, we would be adding marine planning, as uh, Merrick just mentioned, as well as the coastal pelagic species EFH, but we would be looking to postpone the research and data needs item and perhaps take up electronic, electronic monitoring next in September. So thank you. Happy to take any more questions. Uh clarifications or uh, maybe corrections, Mr. Chairman. Otherwise, I guess I would encourage us to then uh, move over to the June meeting format and see if there's discussion there. Well, uh, I'm not seeing any hands waving in the air, so let's move on to format. Okay, uh, well, let's see, as I indicated earlier, so for the June meeting format, um, what we have been proceeding with is the plan for a, a full in-person meeting. Um, keeping in mind that we are uh, still in the midst of our COVID pandemic. Um, and so of course, if things flare up, we would change course uh, in the interest of uh, the council family's uh, health. Um, I would, uh, I guess the question for you is whether uh, at this time you'd like to affirm that plan. Uh, if you have a desire to explore other options, I guess I would uh, outline our possible ways forward in this way. So. One plan is a full in-person, uh, that would be council and the scheduled advisory bodies and the public. Second option would be something like what we've done uh, here this month and in March, where we could pare down um, the number of in-person attendees. And what I would, if that's what you would like to pursue, what I would encourage us to do is to think about, rather than the STT and the SAS, that we uh, call the GMT and the GA and the GAP uh, into the, the June meeting. Um, Beyond that, um, we we do not have the, the the capacity at this time to entertain more hybrid meetings than than two. Um, maybe longer term we could entertain that, but at the moment we do not feel prepared to do that for staffing and resource reasons. Uh, the third option would be going back to a full remote meeting. So those are the three uh, pathways that I see in front of us that are realistic uh, for June. Um, so. Uh, maybe I'll pause there and see um, if there's feedback on our plan. Lieutenant Commander Ettinger. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. I guess I'll start um, with the endorsement that we support a full in-person meeting in June. Um, we'll also put an endorsement for maintaining some level of remote, remote access Acknowledging that might not happen in June, but don't want to lose uh, progress that's made um, in the past year or so. Um, concurrent to the June meeting, uh, we're planning on having a two-day seminar uh, for West Coast LMR officers. That'll be the 8th and the 9th. 
Um, we're going to have a couple of co-seas in the audience if we are in full person um, for that first day of uh, the council meeting. Um, we're also planning to go to the PSF, PSFMC's uh, um, to talk about VTRAX and, and BACFIN. So I wanted to give the co that work for me um, an opportunity to see how the, the process works and how the policies that they're enforcing on the water um, come to fruition. So just uh, in closing, an endorsement, would love to have it in, in full person. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Maggie. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I would certainly support um, the, the option of providing a, a hybrid format uh, for the GAP and the GMT, if uh, if possible, I certainly, um, it's my understanding based on the GMT report that uh, members were on board for a fully in-person meeting. Uh, so they may not, there may not be a need for hybrid there. Uh, I believe there is some interest by uh, some members of the ground fish advisory sub panel in uh, a hybrid format, having the virtual, the option to attend virtually, even if some members are here in person, so I would encourage you to um, explore, you know, staff potentially working with the chairs of those groups, uh, the, the need and opportunities there. Corey. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Just, just to confirm, this includes the um, option for remote public comment throughout the meeting. Is that correct? Yes, uh, thank you, Ms. Writings. Uh, that is correct. What, what we envision for the council ballroom is what we've had here this week. So we would allow for remote public comment um, in, the, in the council chamber. So you can think of the council chamber as us in person uh, facilitating a hybrid connection option for the public. Phil? I would just um, a voice support for the uh, full in-person meeting as planned, currently planned. Um, on the matter of having hybrid um, GMT or GAP or other uh, advisory body meetings, I just know that this the March SAS meeting was ex very difficult because of the audio and all the issues associated with that. And I was in the SAS meeting this time and saw what I would characterize as the extraordinary measures that were taken to try to correct that problem. Um, and, uh, but it, unless I'm not seeing it correctly, doing that for more than one advisory body meeting, given the equipment that was in that SAS meeting is really, uh, I'll call it problematic, if not impossible, given the equipment limit, you know, the equipment that it takes to, to pull that off. So I just, that's my observation. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that comment, Mr. Anderson. I, I, I would, um, I do appreciate your recognition of the rather Herculean effort that Chris and Craig went through to set up the SAS this time around. And if we were to do two uh, hybrid meetings, we would have to secure some additional equipment. Uh, I think we could do it a little bit more efficiently. We learned a bit from this go around, but certainly it's not easy. Um, and if the long-term goal is to foster uh, more hybrid functionalities across our advisory bodies, we would, well, I'll just say we intend to think about that in, uh, for this white paper that we're going to bring back to you in September regarding council process and how to do it more effectively. Um, so we would want to put some thought to it, but I think the, the point that I would like to convey is that we think we're capable of doing uh, a limited advisory body uh, hybrid function uh, in June, we did it here, um, did take a heavy lift. We think we can do it again. We don't want to have this model we did here be the one going forward, but we think we can do it again if necessary. I'll just add that, you know, keeping in mind that in March and April, the public were 
not invited to participate. And so having that hybrid model for the salmon process was was pretty important. Uh, we're not, we're not, from what I'm hearing, we're not expecting that for June. Um, and if we can kind of, can accommodate it for the gap, that would be great. <clears throat> but um, I guess we'll find out whether we're accommodating a great portion of the gap or just one or two people. And if it's just one or two people, we'll just have to take that into consideration in the future. So um, I guess what I'm hearing, and I'm not seeing any other hands, that people are favoring an in-person meeting, fully in-person, with some accommodation for the gap. Because um, I think the GMT was, was an in-person uh, in their statement. So is there any, is that sum, summary in any way incomplete or inaccurate? Okay, we're in good shape. So I'll turn it back to you. What, Bob Dooley. Sorry, Mr. Chair, slow in the draw again. Um, I did, I think it's in, the, in this category. Um, I've noticed the last couple of this meeting and particularly the next one, we have really big overlap with the North Pacific Council and it's affecting our ground fish advisory panel for sure, but others as well. Um, I was hoping that we can somehow, even though these schedules are hardwired, but work through that in the future to try to eliminate that overlap if we can, to the extent we can. I know March and April are really, you know, they're problematic because they've got to be hardwired in pretty much, but maybe there's some collaboration there to maybe fix that problem. Uh, one other comment is, I agree, it's a lift to try to get our advisory panels, particularly uh, virtual or hybrid. But there's an importance to that too, with, with uh, being able to at least um, listen to those meetings for certain members of the industry and public and have the context of what, what's going on there. And given you know travel, particularly how it's expensive, it's gonna be here in the future very shortly. It's gonna affect everything. If we can somehow, I don't mean a full blown system, but somehow think outside the box here to get uh, some participation without having to travel and without having to, for, for public and to, in, to be part of that process. And so I think, you know, things have changed. We've learned a lot of lessons we don't have to be perfect, but we could somehow maybe accommodate that. And um, even if it is to the extent where uh, you can hear the advisory panel meeting and maybe somehow uh, text back in or, you know, use a chat line or something to, to ask questions, maybe don't need all of the, the technical uh, aspects of this, but just making that point that you know, travel is expensive. A lot of the members that participate are fishermen. They, you know, it's a big, a big uh, part of it. We've heard this from others that, that it's a big uh, commitment. And it seems like our the, what we're asking people to do and volunteer and all that participation is important. So I'll leave it there. So just that we, when we think about this and come back in September with the white paper, I hope that those are some considerations that we can add to the list. Thank you. All right, thank you, Bob. <clears throat> Krista, and then Maggie. Yeah, thank you. I um, wanna express support for having full meeting in June. Um, I also wanna acknowledge uh, the comments we just heard about scheduling meetings. And um, I agree, um, I'm supportive of North Pacific, but it, it is also an issue um, in terms of international scheduling. So our, our June meeting um, is the same time frame as the PAC. Um, and we have a number of members who are members of the PAC in the HMS community. Um, I myself am a member of it, but but so are um, two people at, that attend regularly. So we are, um, faced with difficult choices in terms of how to attend which meeting. And I just think that some general um, scheduling for 
all of the advisory groups, probably it, it would be in order um, as we all work pretty closely together here in the Pacific. Thank you, Krista. Maggie Summer. Thanks, Chair. Um, uh, it's just some clarification on your recap with the tentative plan going forward be for all of the advisory bodies uh, to be meeting in person in June or just the GMT and the gap, maybe with an option for a hybrid gap? My understanding is that it's a fully in-person meeting, but that we will endeavor to provide some hybrid functionality for the gap. Thank you for that clarification. And I ask because I, I um, thought I heard uh, when Merrick introduced it, a possible different option where if the gap and the GMT were in person, other advisory bodies would be fully virtual. I don't think we had any discussion no. around the table about that, but I think that's where yeah. the, the question for and the yeah. request that, for clarification was coming yeah. from. That was an option, but there's been a strong support apparently for a fully in-person meeting. So moots that. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, kind of got bucked off this horse a couple of times because it's taken a couple couple of turns, sharp turns. So I just clarify in my mind so the public is listening. Um, when you when you when you mentioned full uh, in person, great. But but then we also mentioned that the testimony for the public would be hybrid. So my idea full virtual is pre March 2020, where it's you know with with some adaptations to the new technology. But but so are we talking you know uh, full full in person with the with the uh, advisory bodies plus public coming to testify or uh, in person or something different? So my understanding is it's full in person, but we will provide the opportunity for the public to provide testimony remotely, but that won't prohibit public from attending the meeting. Okay, thank you for that clarification. We won't discourage it as we have for these meetings in March and April. Corey Runnings. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to voice my support for a, um, I guess what we're calling a full in-person. Um, but also wanted to note that I think some of the ideas and some of these hybrid concepts um, that have been floating around are things that we should consider for the future. And um, I'm guessing these are coming up under the white paper item that council staff is developing. So I, I don't want to jump the gun on that, but just note, um, while for June, I, I think it's been a few years and I think there's a lot of benefit to people um, getting to see each other, getting to meet, um, that there are also some, um, some good ideas that we should be considering for longer term. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Okay, great. And I guess we'll look forward to that white paper in September. And I think the staff has heard loud and clear some of the thoughts folks have had about um, some, perhaps some additional functionality. Um, I, th I think that's June unless I'm missing something. And if, if I'm sure someone will shout at me if I have, but otherwise I guess we can move on to year at a glance. Okay, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So turning to the supplemental year at a glance, we've taken care of June. Um, so looking ahead to our Boise meeting in September, a couple of things to flag for you. One is the, the white paper that we've just discussed, that is the shaded item future council meeting process. Um, my uh, fellow uh, staff, council staff and I are planning to put together a white paper, maybe with some uh, contributions from, uh, from uh, some NIMS folks, um, outlining some ways forward and lessons learned and would bring that back to you at that time, most likely. Um, <clears throat> a few other items that are, uh, shaded here. So we have the question of the trawl catch air program uh, review. Um, that's also related to um, uh, a, a proposal that the region has put in to um, secure some funding that would look at uh, the cost efficiencies that could be gained within the trawl program. 
Uh, we look at those two things as coming together in some way, but we are still awaiting word on that proposal from the region. Uh, we have an item, the Groundfish Strategic Plan um, that is shaded. Um, there's been some discussion of that item and um, uh, potentially uh, moving that off somewhere if there's time needed. Uh, we have non-trawl area management. There is uh, quite an analytical lift uh, between now and that September meeting um, that we are uh, grappling with here as, uh, as staff in the background already. Um, so that item remains shaded um, for a variety of reasons. One is the analytical lift associated with that. Um, let's see, we did, I believe we spoke to swordfish management and monitoring a few times here over the last uh, couple of days. That's also a shaded item. And then for salmon, we have uh, several issues. One is the methodology review. <clears throat> and of course, <clears throat> excuse me, good grief. Of course, um, if the, the FRAM issue does not make it into methodology review, we would schedule something that would take care of that, presumably that, um, uh, uh, coming out of the plan that comes back to us in June. And then we have a couple of other uh, salmon items that are grade, Sacramento River and Klamath River uh, conservation objectives, um, and then the age structured assessment. Um, September is looking <clears throat> fairly full already. And we do have some available space uh, as necessary. Looking over to November, um, that's also uh, starting to look fairly full already. Um, in November, we have a relatively heavy CPS meeting. Um, ground fish is always a um, few items shaded there. Again, the trawl catch air program review, uh, sable fish gear switching issues, um, and a few other items. Um, you know, Mr. Chairman, I don't know that I feel like I need to try to summarize this whole thing. So uh, maybe I'll just pause there and um, see if there's some feedback right away or if uh, Mr. Berner has anything that he would like to flag. Let's first see if Mr. Berner has something to flag and then I think uh, everyone has this year to glance in front of them and if they have comments they want to offer proposed provisions they can offer them. So first Mr. Berner. Thank you Mr. Chair. I guess just quickly I'd highlight a couple changes that I've added that based on feedback this week we've added the recusal policy you see in the administrative item uh, at the bottom there for June and September. We've made that into a two meeting process uh, per some guidance we got from National Marine Fisheries Service. We added a housekeeping FMP amendment to CPS for November uh, per discussions earlier in the week. Uh, and also, uh, based on discussions we heard earlier in the week in Groundfish, we've moved the Whiting Treaty implementation uh, to March. Other than that, uh, I think those is all we need to highlight for this and, and can go right to discussion. Thank you. Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, September Groundfish PM. Is it there and I don't see it or... <laughs> Uh, it's that's going to be an important meeting for advancement of of our EM uh, potential solutions to the issues that are outstanding. So would want to make space on under the ground fish item in September for that. Thank you for that, Ryan Wolf. Yes, thanks, Chair. A few comments on the year at a glance. Um, Phil beat me to it on EM, so I would support that as well on the September agenda based on our earlier discussion. Um, uh, I also think we, I would support unshading the swordfish management and monitoring plan. I do think there is uh, good, some discussion that needs to happen on that plan. I also, we've talked in, in, in the past about a potential workshop that would look into quite a number of swordfish issues, including EFP uh, and, and others, and that could be essentially scoped or at least discussed at that agenda item for a potential workshop over the winter. Um, so support that remaining for November. Uh, at some point, I would like to see something on the, the year to glance here for follow up on the stock definitions. So we'll um, uh, ROA, if you will, um, whether that's November, um, that seems like a, a good target, at least for the year at a glance, whether or not that ends up staying there based on our discussion in June. Um, 
also hard caps. Um, I think if you want a hard caps rule in place by the 2023 fishing year, you would want final preferred alternative in November. So that would be where you would want to add that to the ag. And then finally, um, we are having some workshops later this year um, with POC year participants regarding gear marking and related topics as a result of the humpback uh, biological opinion terms and conditions. So it'd be good to have a placeholder maybe in March, or I guess it could be in April, but sometime in the spring of next year where we can bring back uh, the results of those workshops to the council to get input on that if there is going to be any potential changes to, to POC gear marking regulations going forward. And that concludes my list. Thank you very much, Ryan. Phil Anderson. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, I forgot uh, when I was doing the EM that we we would also want that on the November for a, a PPA and a March for an FPA. Um, Thank you. So. Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, on salmon for September uh, right now, shaded. Um, we have EFH review, SAC and Klamath fall conservation objective review and SAC fall age structure assessment update. Um, I can't really speak to the EFH review item, but with regard to at least the SAC fall conservation objective, we did hear from the SSC and from the STT that they did intend to take a first step on this item with uh, doing some explorations as to the history of the existing conservation objective and, and some review of the literature. But I don't think this item is gonna be ripe for a review by us in September. And as for uh, Discussing uh, or hearing an update on the SAC fall age structured assessment, I, I haven't heard anything about that, um, but I recall that that item is something that we have had on the year to glance for some time um, as a placeholder. Um, but I, I don't know that we are ready to hear about that either, um, especially noting what we expect to receive in terms of new information um, from the STT in, in June. So in sh short, I think I'm supporting kicking all of, or at least those second two items forward into the future. Do you have a suggestion as to when we might move those two items to as, at least to have as placeholders? No, I, I, I thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I would leave that to council staff, but um, I, I support keeping them on the year to glance, but I don't have any idea when they might be scheduled. Um, next topic, I'm just looking at Pacific halibut and we have an item for September on preliminary recommendations for 2023 directed commercial regs. And then we have final on that in November. And I'm just wanting to clarify that if we need to make a recommendation for a regulatory change that um, that is the appropriate meeting schedule and process. Um, I have a feeling it probably would depend on what our recommendation might be and what item we might be contemplating, but would just flag that um, this will be something new, um, presumably with directed halibut under uh, NIMS authority. And so just want to make sure that this is the, the best plan that we can have in terms of year to glance scheduling, given what we know right now. Yes, uh, thank you, Ms. Uremko. Um, at, at this moment, I don't have reason to think that we should be looking at a different set of dates. Um, 
I might look to Mr. Wolf or Mr. Berner uh, as we think about you know, the NIMS taking over management and whether that schedule would work, um, or maybe Mr. Berner has more more insight into this than I do. But at this time, I, that seems to be the best set of dates given uh, given the year. Mike. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Th that's my understanding of the best schedule in terms of getting recommendations. And now, if you, as you've knows, noted, there is some transition going on in, with that fishery. So uh, unless you know, I, this has been out for review for a while, I've heard nothing different from our Pacific halibut experts, but um, maybe Ryan has something in addition. But this is what I expected as, as the best schedule, at least as, as far as what we know so far. All right, thank you. Ryan? Yeah, just to agree with Mike, I mean, <clears throat> I think looking forward in the process, we're expecting similar recommendations from the council as they would ma have made to IPHC after the transition. So yeah, I agree with Mike. Pete Hassemer and then Corey Nye. Different. Excuse me, a different topic if we're done with that one. Uh, well, let's go to Corey first then. Yeah, th thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Pete. Well, just quickly, maybe for feedback at the next meeting is, you know, there. I just I will highlight the interest we've spoken about before in terms of things like adding streamer lines to the halibut regulations and whether it would fit that schedule as well. I don't think we need an answer now, but um, June maybe to, to think about whether we could fit that in. Pete Hassemer. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, this isn't moving anything around right now. It, it's thinking about how we progress through. And I'm looking at underground fish workload and new management measures. We've got updates in September and November and priorities in March. And um, we've also got in September strategic plan review. Sort of the background is I think about it. Um, for, I don't know, three, four, five years on our workload, ground fish workload priorities, um, non-trawl RCA, Emily Platt, mothership utilization have been at the top one, two, three. Um, and those are off now in terms of actions the council has taken. So it works, opens up some workload capacity there. I, I know there's a lot of work to be done on those yet, especially in the NIMS shop. But what I'm thinking about is when we, when we make that decision in March about what's the next set of priorities we tackle, how do we best inform our decision at that time? Um, in, in the past, and, and the, the GMT does a lot of good work in putting together that list and identifying it. But I think at this point, there are things missing um, and a good understanding of what are the major hurdles in completing some of those, what are the obstacles and what's the workload to overcome that. Um, I have one specific example in mind. I, I won't use that maybe just to generalize is um, um, we've got 19 I think it's now 19 items on the B list on the workload priorities. And one of those, the constraint to finishing it is uh, a, a specific difficulty. If we go down this pathway, it appears to be the only pathway and that's a hard thing to do. And some maybe some background work to figure out are there alternative pathways to solve that problem other than the one we have. So maybe my guidance is, as you think about that between now and June is looking at September, is there some um, similarity or relationship between the strategic plan scoping and what we're trying to do and the workload and management measures? So as we move through the, the September and November meetings, when we get to March, that were well informed of what the tasks are that would be needed for the bulk of those items on the the task list and how much time it would take and just allow us to make a better decision because thinking back in the past um it it was just more of trying to guess which is the priority for us 
without a lot of supporting information. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you, Pete. Mercy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to follow up for a minute on Pacific Halibut and remarks from Ryan and from Corey. Um, in addition to the consideration of uh, a streamer line requirement, we've also discussed the need for a VMS requirement uh, as well as um, a potential need to consider uh, action, at least for the California uh, portion of the activity on Pacific halibut that might have um, interactions with quillback rockfish and a need to adjust the regulations for Pacific halibut to minimize bycatch. So um, I heard Ryan say that his interpretation of this agenda item was for us to make recommendations that are similar in nature to those that we would normally make to the IPHC, which involve things like season structure and fishing periods. Um, so I guess I'm back to my original question. Um, you know, does this uh, schedule and the, the item here um, give us the flexibility that we might meet, need to uh, agendize and consider um, additional measures beyond just this season start dates and fishing periods. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Remco. That is a that is a good question. Um, I will admit I don't have an answer right away. Maybe Mr. Wolf does. I see his hand up. Yeah, thanks, um, and Marcy. Thanks for the. Question. I mean, I don't think that it impacts the, the year to glance or the schedule. I think the scheduling is still the same. It, it might change how we agendize them, right? So that you could have those discussions as well as the normal recommendations you would make uh, similar to IPHC. But I think we would still want a September, November timeframe for those discussions. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, um, uh, on halibut, I would just remind the council that uh, some of our directed commercial halibut fishery stakeholders um, are interested in uh, considering other changes to the fishery, uh, specifically, for example, using some of the quota currently put toward the directed fishery to create an incidental retention opportunity with sablefish. Um, we have, our response so far has been that we uh, will not consider that until transition. I'm not suggesting that that be considered in fall of 2022, but just wanted it to stay on the radar for beyond that, um, in particular because I was reminded of this about a week ago by an Oregon halibut fisherman, so didn't want that to, to drop off. Thanks. Thank you, Maggie. Further comments on the year at a glance? Corey Writings. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, regarding the future council meeting process agenda item for September, I was wondering, and I'm sorry, um, Merrick, if I should have asked this question sooner, if you could provide just a little bit more on, on what that's going to look like or if there's any particular updates you have for us on that. Yeah, thanks, Ms. Writings. Um, as you know, we've had a couple of back-to-back -back council meetings here, so we haven't had a lot of time to think through this, but um, I have had a chance to noodle on how to structure this sort of a white paper. And so just for everyone's benefit, the, the intention of that white paper would be to um, first figure out how to do things that uh, best support the council process and council decision making and then other things flow from there. And so when it comes to issues of resources, um, using those resources in ways that prioritize um, the council's work, um, staff workload uh, capabilities and, and quite frankly, the burnout that we see among our colleagues, how to organize that in a way that best protects the council's work. And so that's the organizing theme. Um, a lot of things connected to that, um, technological questions, these questions of hybrid functionalities, how to move forward um, with those, their implications.
additions to our budget. So there are a few things for us to work through. Um, I do see this as a, a summer project that I'll be focused on for a while. Um, and uh, we'll be drawing on some of my fellow uh, staff to help create that white paper. So not a not much headway since March. I'll put it that way, but I, I do have some thoughts about how to how to put something together. Yes, yeah, it's, it's not as if there wasn't anything else going on, right? <laughs> um, let me just see if there are any further further input from the council on the year to glance. And so, uh, Mr. Executive Director, uh, do you have what you need? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think we've uh, done quite well with this agenda item. Um, so we've um, had a good discussion on our June meeting. Uh, we will make some changes there. Um, we've had a uh, good discussion on our June meeting format and what we will continue to aim for is full in person with um, just for everyone's benefit with uh, some hybrid functionalities, especially in the council uh, council ballroom to allow the public to participate remotely or in person. Um, and you've given us some good feedback on the year at a glance. So um, thank you all. And I think we're done with that agenda item. All right. Is there anything further on the agenda, uh, Mr. Anderson? Uh, well, I have, I have one question that don't need to answer right now, and I have a comment. Um, my question is: There was on the SS in the SSC report, there was a, I can't remember how many workshops there were, but there were ten or eleven or twelve of them, and I just, it, uh, I, I'm just caused me to wonder if there's any budget implications or whether that the, the the costs of those have been calculated and and we understand uh our our capability of of supporting those financially that's my question and then i have a comment uh yes thank you mr anderson uh i i had not seen the list of ssc meetings until this morning so um i also made note that that's an extensive list. Uh, we have not worked through the budget implications of that. Um, we will do so. Um, and um, I think that's where we are is, uh, I've got some curiosity about that list of, of meetings. And then if I may, um, our um, folks back there in Command Central, um, have just done an outstanding job in supporting us. Well, not only at this meeting, but previous meetings, but um, I just wanted to acknowledge um, what they have done and how they have been able to help us be successful in the, in the virtual, semi-virtual hybrid world. Um, Things like the computers, the screens, the, the television screens that we have to support us. Um, while we didn't ask for it, uh, they they anticipated, uh, as they always do, um, our needs and how they might better support us in in helping us do our job, and it doesn't go unnoticed. Um, <laughs> The other one, you know, some some things are when they're out of sight, they're out of mind. Um, that's not the case for Sandra. She's she may be out of sight, but she's not out of mind. Um, she calls me Uncle Phil. <laughs> um, and I'm going to start calling her Radar because <laughs> I think she can read our minds sometimes. So, thanks, Sandra. All right, thanks for those comments, Phil. I know that uh, as we transition back into in-person, we have to remember what it was like two years ago, this meeting, when it was our very first all virtual meeting, and it went off seamlessly. And all of the other organizations which with, with whom we participate that had to go all virtual, and the challenges we saw there, the the this this council and the support staff we have, we were the shining city on the hill. Um, and uh, so I think we can't thank 
council staff enough for all the things they do to make this work and particularly thinking about this meeting, how well it has gone. Um, that all starts with, with council staff. So many thanks. So um, I'm not seeing any other bit, oh, Bob Dooley. Sorry, Mr. Chair, I don't wanna beat a dead horse here, but um, Phil made a point last night that we've had a, a pretty easy week. It's been a lot of downtime, but this is like a duck, you know, looks all calm on the surface, but there's a lot going on behind the scene and a lot of work from our, our advisory panels. Those feet are moving all the time. And sometimes you think, geez, why don't we just throw a little more on the plate here? We had the time, but we've got to keep an eye on the feet under the water that, that support us, that get us from point A to point B. And uh, I just wanted to thank them for one, for all their hard work and excellent work. We've got incredible people behind us. They make us look good. But I want to make sure that we keep in mind, too, that just because we get done a couple hours early or something on a day doesn't mean we got to overload our plate and burden them to a place where they, they just can't do their job. So thank you to everyone. And, and I agree with the, our staff here in the council. Just incredible. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Well, that almost concludes our meeting. But it, it cannot go without mentioning that um, while this is not Maggie Summers' last council meeting, it is her last council meeting in her role with as a designee of the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. And um, she has been uh, a tremendously valuable council members, a council member. Um, and I have to say, it's when I've had the gavel and um, we're either wrapped around the axle or um, people have locked jaw and we can't proceed. I can always look to Maggie. Maggie always helps move the process forward. And um, she will be missed in that role. Um, but I know that uh, her replacement will has been shadowing Maggie and I'm sure we'll, we'll pick it up very quickly. Um, uh, so we look forward um, to having Maggie at our council meetings. We'll try to schedule as many agenda items to ensure that she's here at our council meetings. Um, but I, I think that, um, anyway, I just want to. And um, if there's no other business, then I think Maggie Summer has her hand up. Well, thank you for your kind words, Chair. I, I appreciate it. It has been an honor to represent the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife here and to work with all of you and to um, all of you listening and participating virtually as well, all of our advisory bodies and public. So uh, thank you so much for that. And I would move to adjourn the meeting. Second. A second. All right, it's seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, you better not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>